Hello and welcome to the Horn One Podcast. If you're enjoying the show, consider signing up for the Patreon. There you get ad-free content, early access, exclusive episodes, and monthly supporter hangouts. You can find it at patreon.com slash the Juan on Juan podcast. If you don't like the subscription-based models, there are other ways of supporting the show that are linked in the description. Thank you for tuning in and enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Juan on Juan podcast with your host, Juan Ayala. A lot of birds will even throw up when in flight if they're having too much trouble. They actually have a really good mechanism to get all their extra weight out. So we have all these raining blood events that I think could be some of these clouds that may have engorged themselves. Another famous one is Louisiana. The raining bones, millions of bones fell in this town over this big black cloud that threw them up out of the front of the cloud and they were almost all gar bones and scales but literally like a week before they had a flood that receded there was thousands and thousands and thousands of dead gar in the local dam and i think this thing was scavenging ate a whole bunch of gar digested what it could threw up the rest like an owl you know owls will actually do that they'll produce this big pellet of stuff that they can't digest so all this stuff happens in nature already it's just putting it onto an environment that has very little study. But one thing I do think is going to happen, I've made this prediction, in the next five to ten years, they're going to come out and they're going to have a body of one of these creatures. I don't know what type, but they're going to have one and say, like, see, look, UFOs are these things. They're just organic animals. They're harmless. You know, they're the big filter fears. They're like whales in the sky. And I think it'll be the best cover-up for other types of UFOs. Because then, all of a sudden, if UFOs are just an animal, nobody cares about them anymore. Literally, we have species going extinct every day because nobody cares about them. So once people realize there's just animals up there, nobody cares. So every time you see a UFO, it's not a big deal. You've seen an animal. Hey, welcome back to another episode of the Horn One Podcast. I'm your host as always, Juan. Make sure to follow the show on social media. Instagram being my main account. YouTube, Rockfin, everywhere. Leave us a review. It really helps the show. Just take two seconds out of your time. Wherever you're listening to the show, give it five stars. Share it with your friends and family. Whatever it is, get the message out. Get the show out there. And if you're not supporting monetarily, at least... Share it with your family and friends. So hope you enjoy this episode. This was really great. We covered a whole bunch of different topics. I mean, we were all over the place, but it really came full circle. We had a full biology lesson with Justin from Cryptids of the Corn. These guys are great. Check out their podcast. All the links are in the description. But yeah, really, I really enjoyed this episode. It was almost three hours long, but it felt like it's two seconds. Honestly, because I was just having so much fun. But yeah, thank you guys. Bye. And today we have Justin with us. What's up, dude? Hey, hey, hey. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited. We we have one half of the cryptid one of the half. corn, right? And, it, and it's a corn spiracy, right? <laughs> yeah. That's my dad oh, joke gosh. for the night. <laughs> Jay's going to take that. Yeah. So what's uh, up, dude? Oh, living the dream. Thank you for having me on. Sorry, Jay couldn't be here. Uh, they own a bowling alley and... He, so he's the first one on the chopping block when they need people. A bowling alley. That's an interesting business to be in. Oh, well, I mean, that's pretty much the only entertainment we have in this tiny little town. Really? Where are you guys at? Northwest Ohio. It's called Ada. Uh, do you like football? I'm not a sports guy, dude. Neither am I. But every NFL professional football is made in Ada, Ohio. Really? It's a tiny little factory. It's ancient. Wilson's football's. Uh, yeah, but yeah. Oh, you mean like the actual football is <laughs> every football, every football. Really? Yeah, I know. It's super. It's, I don't, I'm not a football guy, so I don't care. But like every once a year, they put a giant pinata up in the sky of this a big football and it explodes and it has brand new footballs in it. It's we're we don't have a lot to celebrate. 
That's a weird ritual to do, right? Put up a yeah. big football <laughs> in the sky and explode it, and little footballs come out of it, almost like, yeah, yeah, because that that and especially that movie, right? Will with Wilson Castaway that that mm-hmm. made that solidified that brand because they do other stuff. They don't do just footballs. They do right. Like we that. just make the NFL grade footballs. Wow, very interesting. Yeah, that's. I live in Florida, so we have plenty of stuff to talk about and plenty of places to go. And it's like when you go to these other places, I always try and picture myself living other places. And I can't so if you picture- want to imagine living in Ohio, this part of Ohio specifically, Ohio is kind of a cool state because it kind of touches four biomes. So each corner is a little different from the others. Uh, but my part of Ohio is just corn. So stand out in the middle of a cornfield and just look around and that's where we live. Can you plug your stuff where people can find you? Yes. Justin, and your show, your you guys do you guys talk about cryptids, you guys talk about UFOs yep. and all that stuff. So I once again I'm Justin. Yeah, my cohort would be Jay. Uh, so I was a fisheries I was a fisheries technician, which is basically a field biologist. It's just easier to say biologist, people don't know what that is. Uh, Jay is the more conspiratorially minded. Jay comes up with some of the crazier theories. So we like to say our show is Cryptids of the Corn Podcast, and you find that anywhere you want, like anywhere you get podcasts. Uh, so we like to say where we're science and magical thinking combined because we just kind of give it flat out, and then me and Jay talk about it. And we come from very different mental backgrounds, but it's always fun because you never know. Sometimes I land on his side of it. Sometimes he lands on my side of it. Yeah, but we don't fight or argue nothing like that. I don't, I'm trying to think of what's the biggest one. Flat Earth's the biggest one, but he just does it to push my buttons. Are you, are you a flat earther or no? No I'm, yeah, no, I'm not. Neither am I. He isn't really either. He just knows it gets under my skin. Uh, but so our other shows, so we do a couple small shows. Uh, we do uh, Freaky Fauna Fridays, which is literally, we do like 15, 20 minutes about a freaky animal from around the planet. Uh, so fauna just means animal. That's all it means. Uh, and that starts a week after this recording. I don't, I podcast or time travel. Yeah. Uh, but then we also do we also produce a show for our buddies DW Conspiracy Shack which is just starting again next week but yeah you can find all that stuff anywhere you can find podcast uh, we do a Facebook live Jay always plugs that so I'll make sure I do that because he'll yell at me if I, if I don't so every Tuesday at 9am we do like a Facebook live hangout because me and Jay take the whole Tuesday off to record our episodes mm. uh, so we, we were sitting there talking for an hour anyways, having coffee. Like, well, we'll put on a live feed and just hang out with everybody. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of fun. Uh, we have people all around the planet check into that. Uh, we got a lady from New Zealand, a lady from Australia, and I think it's a lady from Guam that's always in there. So she stays up super late to get on that. Interesting. Yeah, but, that's uh, cool. I, I think that's all of our stuff. I always forget, I always forget something. And so... And correct me if I'm wrong, because obviously you're in the in the realm of biology. But when you said that there's only corn, is that what they're referring to when they call it a monocrop, where it's like one place is used just for that one crop? Kind of. So we're mostly corn. We do have we are rotation croppers up in Northwest Ohio, uh, but it's mostly the big production numbers corn. They only plant soybeans or another crop when they have. Sorry, they only plant soybeans or uh, other crops when they have to, uh, just to help renutrify the soil and stuff like that. So soybeans, mm. corn do a really good relationship, because what corn puts into the soil and takes out, the exact opposite happens for soybeans, for example. So whatever compounds that they're wanting to crave, one gives them off as a byproduct and one takes them in, vice and vice versa. Interesting. Yeah, that's uh, funny how that works, right? Yeah, that's. I mean, partially that's nature. You know, we've uh, one of my big push button like hot topic buttons is like a GMO. I hate the word GMO because everything is a GMO. But people like every chicken is a GMO. Your dog's a GMO. Genetically modified organism. Selective breeding is in that. We're a GMO. Mean that we, yeah, we are. We, we selectively bred over years. Yeah. So that's just my hot button. So nature does a lot of the work. I don't think you should be spraying Roundup on freaking corn. I don't kind of like that idea of eating that, but that's just me. Heavy opinions over here. But here you are sipping on that, the red oh, yeah. dye Mountain Dew diet with, does it have aspartame in it at all? Does I'm it, sure it does. I just, I wanted to try it. But hey, keep the roundup off the crops, right? 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what is it about where where do you want to get started? Because this is gonna be about UFOs, about cryptids, and, and is that why you named it cryptids of the corn? How many cryptids are known to be in the corn? Is it a lot of a cryptids? Lot. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, a lot. It's it's kind of weird. But how he got the name, Jay loves telling this story, so I'm taking all of his all of his credit. But we first formed the Hardin County Bigfoot Society. Uh, which was kind of like a local group. People stopped coming to meetings and it kind of fell apart. So me and Jay were the only ones going. And uh, so we're just like, well, let's do a podcast because we're just sitting here talking for an hour every week anyways. Uh, so we started the podcast. But how yeah, you've seen our, our Harry, the Bigfoot, our logo, right? That Bigfoot standing out in the corn. Yeah. So we had that image before we had the name for the podcast. So a local farmer... Uh, I'll say his first name. His name's Kenny. Uh, he's very, very big pillar of our community. He's one of our biggest farmers in the area. Like he's just he has like fourteen thousand acres in three counties wow. in government land, as in land he's not farming because they're paying him not to farm it for wildlife and stuff. Sure. Uh, so, so he has a lot wildlife, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so he came up to us. We're Jay is the bartender at the bowling alley. And I'm a drunk. <laughs> so we were sitting there talking, and this guy comes up, and a little old man, he's like 91, I think, when this happened. And he's like, you guys believe in all that big football crap? We're like, yeah, yeah, we do, you know. We're, we we both have our Hardin County Bigfoot t-shirts on. They're bright yellow. They got Bigfoot on the front. Like, yeah, we, we believe in Bigfoot. And he's like, ah, it ain't real. He's like, I did see something weird once. So... I don't know if you guys have much uh, harvesting done at night down there for any of your crops in Florida. Dude, all we really grow is oranges. I mean, it's the orange state for a reason. That and I want to say sugar cane, like down I'm sure, south. Yeah, sugar cane's a hot, wet crop. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> okay, so with corn, uh, when we harvest in the in the fall, well, oftentimes we'll harvest all day and all night because there's so much to get in. We have, you know, you have to keep working. So what's called a combine, which is, I'm sure you've seen them, the big giant things that eat all the corn or mm -hmm. all the beans and stuff and push them into a bin behind it. Uh, they'll have like stadium lights on the front of them. Yeah. So at night, like literally, I think I was like eight or nine and I thought there was a UFO coming into the house because <laughs> you could just see this, like the whole, like we lived out in the middle of a cornfield. So he was just coming by the house and just all this big array of lights. But so Kenny, he was out there harvesting the field late at night and he's like a guy stood up and starts running he's like that's not weird he's had people growing pot in the middle of his fields he's at so we are a college town so college kids go out and do college kid things in the field because mm -hmm. they i don't know they have nothing else to do because we have nothing else to do uh so he's like that's not weird you know there's a lot of people and stuff when we go combine and stuff that'll take off it's like what was weird is when he was running i could see his head and his shoulders as he was running through uh if you, if you don't know much about how big corn gets in Ohio, a bad, bad year is six, six and a half foot tall corn at harvest. Most of our corn is going to be eight or nine foot tall on an average year. So let's say it's the worst year of corn. So it's at least six and a half foot at the shoulder. And his head was popping up straight up. Like his the, shoulders like and logo. his head. Yeah, yeah. It's again, old farmer, not, not my words, but kept saying just a big black guy. You know, just, you know, because he's just like, I could see him. He was a big black guy running through the field. And we're like, do you think it could have been Bigfoot at all? He's like, oh, no, 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 it couldn't be Bigfoot. And so I'm like, okay, I guess Shaq was out there. Yeah, or was a big running black through your guy. Running cornfield. <laughs> like, uh, but he, I see that's like, we, we kind of talked about it off air and stuff. Like, but that's one of the people that, that story will die with him if he wouldn't have told mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. Like, he doesn't, he, like, why would he come up to us wearing Bigfoot shirts to tell us that story? if he didn't believe in Bigfoot in some way, in some shape or some aspect. You know, he first starts off really aggressive saying Bigfoot's bull crap, tells a story, and then goes back to saying Bigfoot's bull crap. But we've ran into that a lot. It's mm -hmm. especially that older generation, you know. Like, if you were to think about that in the 60s, when we, you know, in the 60s, a lot of people were doing amazing UFO research, pyramid research, all this stuff. But Bigfoot didn't really get even in the public mind very like extreme until like the middle to late 70s 
uh, you know, movies like Beast Boggy Creek and the Patterson Gimlin, you know, that kind of got the ball rolling. So in the early 60s, there wasn't a whole lot going on. So those people are holding those stories because they don't want to be crazy. Mm-hmm. But that's how the long story of how we got our logo. And then it was a cryptid standing in the corn. So that's all. It, children of the corn, cryptids of the corn. We played on that. And it's always, do you guys have any, and it's surprising to me how many people don't know about crop circles. There's some people who oh, yeah. have never heard about crop circles. Is there any crop circles there where you guys are at? And is, is it mostly just plains or do you guys have some mountains? So we are in fully glaciated Ohio is what it's called. We are pretty flat. Uh, I've been out to Kansas a lot for work and stuff like that. We're not as flat as Kansas. But as far as the Midwest goes, we're pretty close. Yeah. So this little area, this corner of Ohio we're in, all across the top of Indiana and into Illinois, is really, really, really flat. It actually creates a big wind tunnel. We'll get like, and then we get like ice effect and lake effect and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So we're pretty flat. But the thing with a flat plane is you can't see very far, even though you kind of can. But if there's something in your way a little bit. You can't see past it at all. You know, you you can't rise or lower yourself at all. Uh, yeah, don't that that'll trigger flat earthers too, bro. If you if you tell them you can't see on the other, yes, yes, I can. You know, I'm saying? <laughs> I can see. Cur- you can't see the curve. Can you see the curve, Justin? Can you, dude? How many curve? So how much they mileage? They were all picking on me. We yeah. were uh, Joel. Yeah, uh, Joel wasn't, but we were up ice fishing with Joel, and me and Jay were drinking. And when Jay starts drinking, it's funny because he gets. Jay's really quiet, and he's like four foot two, and he's not really, he's my height, but we just always, it's another joke on the podcast, is Jay gets smaller every episode. He's a uh, homunculus, bro. Yeah, but he starts screaming when he gets drunk. He's normally really quiet and reserved, and then he's just screaming about me about Flat Earth, uh, but <laughs> it's making me laugh again, and, and Joel's just sitting there smiling. Joel don't drink. Joel's just sitting there smiling. Laughing, because he could just see Jay winding me up. And that's the thing about the whole flat Earth thing, because it kind of encapsulates other ideas within it too. Where it, like, space is fake, and I've heard it fake and gay. So you have this this homosexual <laughs> space where, because you talk about UFOs a lot, what are your thoughts on if? Because I know people who don't even believe in aliens, right? They they don't. And by me talking about the occult and magic and other entities, spirits, demons, daemons, whatever you want to refer to them as, it would be pretty ignorant to rule out the possibility of aliens or of these cryptids. What if these are the inhabitants of these unseen dimensions, right? Of these other this other side. If there's a portal, well, maybe we're seeing something that came through that portal or whatever it is right and and just because this reality is the one that we experience doesn't mean that there's nothing else on the other side that that we don't 100 percent perceive because perception is a very big i yeah. think it's the key to everything i mean we first off we can only see a very limited mm-hmm. amount of the light spectrum so there could be whole things that are just reflecting ultraviolet light that we can't see and when we get into the organic ufo thing here in a bit that's going to come up where, you know, uh, if they were just reflecting ultraviolet light, then the human eye couldn't pick them up anyways, on most of the time, you know. Uh, but for interdimensional cryptids, I think there's really, I think that's perfect, because there's, we did it with our Mothman series. We did nine hours. Uh, sorry, my connection's bad. We did nine hours on the Mothman, and we did the interdimensional angle. So as me with the biology background, I kind of put cryptids in two groups. Ones that fit our biosphere, so that tree of life that we have on this planet, we can put most animals, plants, and fungi on somewhere on the, like a branch of that tree. And I think a lot of cryptids we can do that too. Like uh, Bigfoot, maybe interdimensional, may not be, but it makes biological sense. We had a creature called the Gigantopithecus that would, if it's that's argued whether it could stand up on all fours or if it stood up on all twos or it was quadruped on all fours. But if it did stand up on two legs, it had been over 16 feet tall. So that dwarfs most Bigfoot reports. That's huge. So bro. we had a primate that was giant. So that's not biologically impossible. You know, that doesn't saying Bigfoot doesn't make sense on that angle 
you know, but when we look at creatures like the Mothman, uh, it does have some Earth kind of biology stuff, but the glowing red eyes, a lot of people, we do, we did a whole thing on the untold stories of Mothman where it seemed like it was just scared and lost and was accidentally making people very sick. A lot of people seem to have uh, light radiation symptoms from it's it. It's just a misunderstood cryptid creature. I think it's an interdimensional raccoon. Uh, <laughs> It, yeah, that's a whole thing, but... Uh, wait, Mothman, wait, are you for real? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll tell you. I'll, I'll explain that here a little more, but uh, the, these creatures, so it was mostly seen flying without flapping its wings, and it, it had big glowing eyes, and it had these biological features, or its biological features, that don't make sense here on Earth, but doesn't mean it's not an animal from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Whether, like, that's where... I'm a big proponent on the interdimensional stuff. So, like, most people don't know, the TNT plant we kind of think it had an underground facility uh, where they were testing the stuff. I think they may have been opening basically very stranger things. I'm a big proponent that the government or whatever will leak that stuff out to us. You know, uh, mm -hmm. and I think the Mothman's a side effect. Where you look at Chernobyl and you look at Chicago where these underground things are, where these weird things are happening, Mothman-type creatures pop up. So when I say interdimensional raccoon, what I mean by that is that wherever they're coming from, I think they're very common. Yes. And they're not supposed to be here. I think they're accidentally getting pulled through. I think like they're, we could be sending black bears over there. You know, mm -hmm. we don't know. I think when these portals open up involuntarily or accidentally, that stuff on either side of the door can get thrown over to each side. And I think these cryptids like the Mothman and stuff, what, they're not very, what we'd say, intelligent acting. Now, the Mothman wasn't doing anything. It was hiding a lot. You know, it was looking for food. It acted. There was that one couple that said, they didn't fear it. It sounded like it was talking like a mouse, but it kept motioning for something in the lady's purse until they started throwing up. And they, she said, we were never scared of it, but they got really sick and then went to the hospital and the hospital said, you have radiation poisoning. What were you doing? So that could be that the Mothman comes from a plane that's extremely radioactive and they evolved to adapt to that kind of situation. That so doesn't bug them, but whoa. they're holding on to the. Yeah. Well, where I said whoa because where'd that account come from? I, I had never heard about that account. See, we do, yeah. We did a whole big thing on the untold stories of Mothman. They're out there. It's just they're not the big flashy ones that people ever talk about. So I believe that one was uh, from the guy that runs the Mothman Museum. His book. Mm -hmm. He went and interviewed all those people. A local uh, West Point Pleasant, West Virginia guy, a uh, Jeffrey is his name. Jeff, uh, super nice guy. If you ever get down to Point Pleasant, stop in, talk to him. He's great. But. There's this whole series of stories where it just seems like an animal, a scared, lost animal that doesn't belong here. And it does all these behaviors that seem like that. You know, there's the famous where it's chasing the car case, the, the Scarberry case and stuff like that. But it didn't hurt anybody. It had opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to really hurt somebody. And it never did. It made people sick when they got too close to it. Uh, very, very, and then uh, the conjunctivitis. Uh, so there's two types of conjunctivitis. Everybody at home, that's pink eye. There's one you get from like fecal material in your eye, stuff like that. The other one is Eating from radiation. Ass. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the other one's from radiation. My mom was do. Uh, my mom had cancer, and when she was going through chemo, she would get conjunctivitis like so bad from the radiation they use. Uh, about one in three ca cancer patients get that like extreme conjunctivitis, and a lot of these Mothman people had this conjunctivitis and you hear it with ufo accounts too that they get like tans and they get like their eyes swell up and stuff like that that's a sign of radiation so that could be wherever they're coming from is it either so could be extremely radioactive background and we have animals on this planet that handle radiation like nobody else so it's not saying that it you know it's not out of the question to have an animal in this place they can survive levels of radiation that we can't that's really did you break? Yeah. Did you break up there real quick? Yeah, sorry, but uh, if it's coming in, you know, it's bringing its background radiation with it. Mm -hmm. It's not meaning to make anybody sick, uh, but then you have you have all kinds of these weird one-off cryptids. Like we're doing an episode soon on the Milford shrooms, which were these giant. It's it's the giant fuzzy peanut parade, and they just seem like animals. Like a lot of these one-off cryptids that maybe that have these really weird biologies. Mm -hmm. I think maybe these interdimensional animals, and they're just they're side effects of something else. You know, these portal whether the portals are being opened on purpose or not. I don't think these cryptids are doing it. Yeah. 
I just think that when the door opens, stuff gets thrown through. And I also think that because you have that possibility, but how what what about the possibility of the government mutating things and that existing in this realm? Because that's also probably another possibility too. And maybe that's why you get the one ofs of whatever the because it's usually the Bigfoot, the typical Bigfoot. Ours is the skunk ape. Somewhere mm-hmm. else, it's the boggy creek monster somewhere it's the same thing though and it it goes it reminds me of mythology where you have all these gods you have all these myths but they're all the same god with different names different iterations of the different cultural influences of that geographical area right or the people Mm -hmm. or the society that they're in well they called it this and these other people the other side called it this but they were probably seeing the same thing so and you get usually the bigfoot you get that and the Mothman is an interesting one because, yeah, I never thought about it like that. And I had never actually, I think I might have done an episode on a, on a show that I used to have. And, yeah, I did not. I, but that, that's a really interesting story about the where they made the person sick, almost like a, a defense mechanism, right? Like a skunk will spray you or an armadillo rolls up. Well, this one just like, it's like a Pokemon. It just lets out radiation, right? The only reason I would maybe not think it's on purpose, like a defense mechanism because all the stories were either it's coming towards them or it's like there was the one. So they used to call it the bird's nest. It was the main building that was left on TNT. They tore it down like 2006 because it was extremely dangerous. But uh, when you would drive down, you could still see it. They called it the birdhouse because the big black bird lived there. The Mothman. Uh, a guy that was coming home on a motorcycle and he's seen two giant bicycle reflectors on the top and they're glowing, you know, so he's like, all right, there's kids up there. You know, it's dangerous. It's like six stories tall. So he's going to go up there and tell these kids, you know, get out of here. You know, it's not, you're going to kill yourselves. So he gets out and he starts walking around up there and he can't find anybody. And as he starts walking down out of one of these rooms comes out the Mothman. And they're like feet apart from each other. And it looks just as surprised as he, he claims it looked just as surprised to see him as he was to see it and they both looked at each other for a minute and then they both went like he the mothman kept going down the hallway he went down the stairs like it just like i don't want nothing to do with you is this the yeah, one so that's here? one of the tnt bunkers that's a bunker there's about 50 of those out there so uh look type what'd you type in i put the the bird, bird house. mothman yeah i'm trying to think what it would what else just to get some oh. visuals in here for the people watching on youtube because yeah. right I'm sure that they don't want to. I know that's you, it right there. Which so one? That's the warehouse part of it. So it was a big factory for the TNT plant. This? Nope. Uh, uh, you just wrong it a second ago. I seen it. Go down two rows. Oh no, on the main thing. Sorry, I'm not good with explaining. Right? Okay. Oh, See this that one. white apron right there. Yeah. Mm. So that was on. It was on the roof of that building, but there's whole floors missing from it. That's a slightly different building. That's one of the stores. There it is. That's the birdhouse. And and it's in the middle of nowhere, or where is this exactly? Do you know? Well, it used to be out in the middle of the TNT plant, but now the TNT plant's a wildlife area. So it was literally in the middle of a forest at this point. And it makes me think of what, what was the... Was it Teddy Roosevelt that enacted the National Parks Law? Was, yes. was it him? And yep. it makes me think, right, because you're talking about your buddy that has the 14,000 acres and I have property so I can picture what 14,000 acres would look like. And that's that could be an entire city and some like right? 14,000 acres. It's an entire different oh, yeah. world. And the the whole thing about vast open areas such as the desert where the Jin live or even the Everglades, which I've been to the Everglades and I was telling you about the Smoky Mountains and going out fly fishing out there. It's a different feeling, right? It's a different atmosphere. It's magical. It's charged. And you don't know what happens out there at night, right? When there's nobody around, does well, what's the saying? Does the bear shit in the woods if there's no one around to hear it or whatever it is? Or if the tree mm-hmm. falls in the wood, did it really happen? Well, what if that the whole conspiracy is what if he did that in order to protect these things or he made a pact with the greys or whatever the conspiracy was with that? And the idea that the missing 411, they go missing in a lot of these national parks. What's going on? And 
I don't know if you've ever been on Reddit. I'm sure you have with the mm-hmm. the no sleep the no sleep subreddit. And I remember this came out probably six years ago. And I went on that. I would go on it at night to read stories, like scary stories. Ooh, right. And they would freak me the fuck out. They would they would really freak me out. And there was this particular set of stories. I don't know if you've heard of it. A lot of podcasters have covered it. But there was this this particular set of stories that it was a, of a search and rescue officer. You know which one I'm talking about? You ever run across those? The search and rescue officer stories? Jay talks about one, but go ahead, because I'm not it's not coming to my mind. So the story was it was this search and rescue officer that was telling his or her stories. And it was very bizarre. They would find people up in the trees. They don't know how they got there. They would find people with special needs that would go missing with food in their stomachs. Like if if, people with autism or or Down syndrome type of thing where they would have food in their stomachs and they'd be taken care of by what or by who. Or in there would be areas that would appear back in areas that they had like searched over and over again off the main path. The people would just show up. And there was one particular story. So me, I'm thinking all this is real. I'm reading these stories at night. They're freaking me out. I'm like, I was, bro, I was scared because it, it's so realistic. And there was a particular story about the stairs in the woods. Mm-hmm. And the stairs that would appear, new, old, different gothic styles, just these random staircases that would appear on the woods. And he was told to never, or they were told never to go around them, never to touch them, never to to step on them, never to look at them, whatever. These are things that just happen out here. We don't know what's going on, but don't ever touch them. And there's stories of in that story, in that realm, that myth, that myth- mythological world of that storyteller, people would who stepped on them would be teleported to other places, would feel very sick, would have hallucinations, would never be seen again, whatever. And that's fine. It was a story. I found out later it was it was fake, but I thought it was real for a very long time. I thought it was real until I, I started progressing because it's like six or seven parts. And turns out it was fake. And I was kind of like bummed. I was like, damn, this they're, they're really good at telling stories. They should write a book. And she was like putting together a book. But I remember the last post that she posted was, hey, listen, this was only meant to be fake. Like this was a, this was a story. But no, dude, there was people sending her real stories of mm-hmm. stairs in the woods and mm-hmm. their experience with the stairs in the woods. So it was like she bred this. I don't know if she manifested it because it went viral on Reddit or if she was like manifesting this ecosystem or something. But I, for the longest time, for a very long time, for for a couple of years, bro, I thought the stories were real. And she would post up there because it would be like a diary. Like, hey, guys, I experienced this today. And it'd be like one post. She's like, I'll get back to you guys here soon. And then she would sign off. And I'm like, yo, I want more. And then it got to the point where she like ended it. And at the, the one of our last posts was like, hey, this is just I'm writing a, a book about this. I'm just an author. This isn't real. Why are you guys sending me stories of the stairs in the woods? What's going on? So I don't know, dude. It, it's these vast areas. I've always said hold like this key there's a reason why secret societies go out to to the middle mm-hmm. of the desert right you have a lot of the elites epstein had a a house in new mexico the land of enchantment near the trinity site right mm. nest nested in some in some mountains on ten thousand acres so what are they doing out there right you have burning man in the middle yeah. of nowhere you have crowley talking about how in the middle of nowhere in these places, these deserts, there are spirits that are wandering. There are demons that are wandering and they're looking for hosts, right? So I don't know, dude. It's really interesting though. Oh, yeah. For the staircase, I was just listening. You ever listen to Appalachian Intelligence? I haven't listened to their podcast, but I know who you're talking about, yeah. Okay. Uh, love those guys. Sorry, my internet's so bad. I don't know what's happening. You're I pay for though. the best internet, and I still have problems. Dude, me too. <laughs> uh, but anyways, they just had uh, they just had an episode about the staircases in the woods, and I've actually seen them. I grew or I went to college in Wayne National Park, which has a lot of disappearances every year. 
but those are probably mostly due to open mine shafts that aren't documented. There's a lot of them. I about fell in one once, but Whoa. I found them. I found them out there that empty the staircases. But for Appalachia, especially this part of Appalachia, what happens is uh, there's no part in the Appalachia you can go into that didn't have a homestead on it at one point. Like I don't care how far back into a holler or how far back on a mountain you get, you're gonna find like old homestead site. Like most time anymore, it's barely a foundation. But one of the things they used to build, and this is the older set here. This doesn't mean anything for like the younger stairs and stuff like that. But they, one of the toughest things they would build were the staircase into their house, like a wooden steps and stuff like that. So most of the time when we'd find them, they'd be two or three steps, and that'd be it. But I never had anything weird happen with them or nothing like that. I just, I have seen them out way national. Yeah, I'm sure there's a logical explanation, but well, I don't think for all of them. But I'm just saying, I the ones <laughs> I've seen because they're normally like three or four big slab stones that are kind of stacked, so mm -hmm. you can stand into them mm -hmm. or stand up. You know, I think. Uh, oh, you're going to, you're going down to my. Oh my gosh, Cade's Cove soon. Uh, you go through Cade's Cove. There's old home. There's three homesteads back there, and you can actually walk up one of the steps on one of the homesteads. Yeah, I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah, my dad went. They went out there on their motorcycles. I know what you're, what you're talking about. Oh, we love Kate's Cove. We're, we, me and my wife go salamandering, so we go to find salamanders, take pictures of them. Dude, you know I saw that that in in Knoxville has the highest concentration of salamanders, which was like the most random Smoky, thing. S Smoky Mountain National Park has one of the top three most biodiverse places on the planet. What that means is the most amount of species. Uh, sp uh, specifically, it has the most number of salamander and newt species on the planet, several of which are only found in Smoky Mountain National Park. For one, like uh, the Smoky Mountain Dusky Salamander. I'm a salamander guy. The room behind me, everybody at home, is literally full of salamanders. Really? I think, yeah. I think Manly P. Hall writes about salamanders being like one of the elementals. So we could talk, oh gosh, now see, we're famous for side tangents. So I have a species called fire salamanders. Uh, they're black with yellow spots. Uh, no, oh, in the U.S. we have spotted salamanders are kind of similar. These guys are from Europe. So, yeah. It's, it's so got to do with alchemy. So that's because I'm, I'm yeah. real big into alchemy and the salamanders always referred as one of the ingredients i don't know which, which i'm not a practicing alchemist but here's the salamander in the fire wait well, i'll tell you the story of how that came to be because i'm a big salamander guy but just type in fire salamander show everybody what they look like if you wouldn't mind because they're one of my favorite animals Whoops. uh nine of them paid for half of our wedding me and my wife nine really babies. yeah they're not cheap this so yeah there's yep and they're the first nomenclature salamander, so their scientific name is salamandra, 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 depending on what subspecies you're talking about. So these guys have really cool abilities. So why they're associated with fire, for example, uh, fire. everybody knows salamanders, where do they love to live? Well, wet logs, stuff mm -hmm. like that. But a lot of European houses would actually build half their house into a hill or cover half their house up with dirt to help you know, insulate the house. So these salamanders would live inside the walls and they'd live in these moist logs. So the first thing was when you were getting ready to put out, like one of the things you put a fire at was kind of a wet log. You'd throw that in the fire to let it burn itself out. All these salamanders would start crawling out of the log. Fire salamanders have a flame retardant mucus that fluffs up like sheep's wool when they're in the flames. So they're fireproof temporarily. So when you throw this wet log into the fire, a bunch of salamanders would come out of the fire. So people got the idea that the salamanders were born of fire. <laughs> and then when these houses would catch on fire, literally thousands of fire salamanders would come pouring out of the walls. And they used to think that the, like witches and like, like magic and stuff, people were sending these salamanders to catch your house on fire because they didn't like you. Uh, so they were almost hunted to extinction in the, uh, like the medieval times due to this reputation. Whoa. So... And they're still endangered to this day most places. The Elementals, Manly P. Hall, right? He was a 33rd degree Freemason. He was he was given that because he understood the symbolism way better than the actual Freemasons. But the Magician, having 
having drawn his circle, and this is from the secret teachings of all ages, is here shown invoking the various elemental beings who are emerging from the respective haunt. And I'll show the picture he's talking about. From the earth at his feet come the gnomes, from the water of the water, the undines, undines, undines. Better than I would pronounce it. Yeah, whatever. From the fire, the salamanders, and from the air, the winged sylphs. I don't know what that is. In like fashion, we observe the modern magi magician employing their holy scientific protocols to invoke the little gray space alien. Elementals of our day languishing in the terminal errata of their absurdity, inappropriate culture bound mythos. So kind of the holy scientific protocols, the modern magician. So when you talked about science and magic earlier, well, I think it's the same thing, bro. It's trust the seance, right? I think it all originates. I think that I love how Jay Widener puts it because he, he said they take alchemical technology and they turn it into like modern technology. So stuff that alchemists would use back then, they just turn it into a, a meat and bones like cell phone or computer. But essentially, it's the same thing. And if you look at any any foundation of any techno technological advancement, it, it really they were occultists, bro. They were trying to prove the existence of God or trying to prove the existence of the devil or whatever, or they were into theosophy or like consciousness and manifestation. All those guys that were, I mean, even Da Vinci was into alchemy and all these guys, they were, they were looking into all those, that type of stuff. So the modern magicians <laughs> employing their holy scientific protocol to invoke the little gray space alien. So what are your thoughts on, and I'll show that picture because it's really, it's a really cool picture. What are your thoughts on that about, because we know I mentioned Crowley earlier where he summoned lamb and I think that it was a species of alien gray, but then I can't attribute like Parsons and doing the Babylon working ritual with L. Ron Hubbard to ripping a portal in space and time and them them being the cause of the ufo activity now because we have ufo accounts since the beginning of time aborigines have one painting i believe that depicts a ufo with gray like creatures that's forty four thousand years old or something like that we have a bunch of australian listeners and they've sent me what do they call them i can't remember the name but they have a name where they like these big bulbous head black eyed things no mouth no ears nothing big spindly necks uh but the aborigines would say they came from the stars this is the picture that he that he was the plate in the book that he was talking about so mm. we have the water we have the salamanders and this is the the magician invoking all the elements and one of the things that i don't know if it was mainly p hall or who it was but in one of his lectures he was talking about how and Carl Jung talked about the UFO as being a projection of the psyche. Manly P. Hall talked about how a man who is plagued with just thoughts and stress is able to manifest elementals that will bug him. Right. And it makes me think, I don't know if you saw the movie homunculus on Netflix. Did you mm -mm. see that movie? Mm -mm. Well, the homunculi in that movie, they are, like plagues of they attach themselves to people and they're like the negative the most negative aspect of the person so whatever addictions or whatever trauma they're holding that's a homunculus and that attaches itself to the person and it's metaphysical so they can't see it until this guy drills a hole right here right the third eye and opens up his skull and he's able to cover one of his eyes and he's able to see this other realm and he's able to Spoiler alert, rip the homunculus off the people, but under the condition that it attaches itself to him. So it's right. almost like he's taking this pain away from people, but him himself, he's be, he's being consumed by the homunculi, right? So it's like this weird thing. It's, it's a really trippy movie, but you should probably check it out. I'm going to watch it. I'll yeah. probably watch it after this. Yeah, it's, it's trippy. It's kind of, there's, there's R-A-P-E in it, which is kind of like weird, right? Yeah. But I didn't like that part of it, but just a heads up to anybody who's going to check it out. There is like a scene where I, I I perceived it as that. I don't know if that's what it was, but whatever. 
But yeah, it's it's like these entities outside how you're saying we're talking about perception and seeing things in the occultist mundi, the hidden world that we're not able to perceive. Well, what if these elementals are all that? And then what if the salamander is like like the I don't know, when when a when an occultist is able to change or it's it's familiar, right, for magical purposes? Like I don't know. <laughs> Just something I have no idea. About. That's like, I wish Jay was here because that's up Jay's alley. But I don't know, as far as like aliens and stuff like that, because I know we've we've talked about it already a little bit, I don't think personally, and this is all personal opinion, I don't think we've ever been visited or at least actively visited by extraterrestrials in the, in the sense of the word extraterrestrial. What? I do think there are the phenomena happening. I don't, I'm not discounting the phenomena. I do think people are getting abducted. I do think things are happening i don't think it's actually like aliens from another planet i think uh personally i'm a christian i think a lot of this stuff is the especially specifically the really nasty abductions i mean the torturous abductions i mean we've covered a whole bunch of them that are just you couldn't like i i did wildlife research i abducted species to do studies and stuff <laughs> the lack the, like the purpose i've never purposely hurt anything and we actually took great care make sure it went back fine the if a lot of people claim that's what some of these extraterrestrials are doing is it's kind of like that they're researching us the amount of torture and the amount of pain that's inflicted upon the humans that get abducted is well beyond a scientific uh, reasoning in my in my personal opinion that's why i think a lot of those type of entities are demons with a new face uh that they're matching the time so we talk about it a lot where why don't you see modern biblical miracles as in I believe miracles happen every day. Uh, I've experienced miracles myself, but I'm saying like the big pillars of light and stuff like that because we all have cameras now. We all have all this documentation stuff and that gets rid of faith. When it's fact, it's not faith. Then it's not belief. When it's everybody can see it, then there's no, re there's no choice. You're like, okay, I can see the giant pillar of light with God's face in it. Like I, I'm not doubting that. I think demons have to do the same thing because if they just come out and be demons and get caught, then that also proves the other side. So they still want to go out and they still want to cause all the, it's just so much pain and torture that happens to these people that I really think that a lot of those entities are demonic. I think there are entities that are interdimensional too. So like if, it, if there's a being that's not demonic, that's not from here, that's our favorite word for it, and not from here, uh, they're probably interdimensional in my opinion because that type of travel would make more sense than uh, open space travel because open space travel would be very very difficult to do as far as we can tell right now uh, and then I also think there's oh, so what I say the not from here's demons oh and a lot of UFOs I think are hidden tech either hidden technologies government technologies and then well you know my favorite subject the organic UFO which we'll get into uh, whenever you're ready but yeah so that's kind of my basic opinion on it I don't think any of the aliens or the entities that we're in contact with are true extraterrestrials in the sense of the word extraterrestrials. I definitely believe there could be an intelligent entity from another dimension. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get that. I just think somebody coming across the, the, the only thing I think I could kind of, and that's just an opinion. Jay doesn't share the same opinion as me. It's just an opinion. Uh, that, that big round rock that came through a couple years back passed by the earth, you know, this cylindrical rock, I can't remember what the name of the object is. It came off and it wasn't on any known orbit. Apophis or whatever in... it's called? No, not that. That one's coming. Apophis is coming. So this one is just left our solar system, but it passed Earth like eight years ago. It's got a weird name. Yeah. A, a Mahu Mahu or something like that. Yeah. 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 Something like that. You say its name twice. I'll look, I'll look it up now. I'm going to summon a demon out of that. Hold on. Yeah. <laughs> Be careful saying just random words. But no, so it passed really close to the Earth. It was on no, no known orbit. So well, that means two things, whether it's on an orbit, of it's orbiting something we don't know exists yet, which is completely possible, or the less likely option, but the one I kind of think, is it was either thrown or it was programmed to fly a certain pattern and collect data. And it even seemed to slow down when it got into our solar system, and right before it was leaving, it seemed to speed up. So I'd be like, it was doing a slow scan what a lot of people think, like scan in the solar system, get map and what everything's here, and then 
When it's done, it's moving on. So that could be definitely a form of extraterrestrial life that kind of visited Earth. Uh, another thing is that people have a really, in my opinion, we don't know what aliens are going to look like. To say that they're going to look like us or have any semblance of us, like greys kind of look like us, reptilians look like us, you know, the Nordics especially look like us. For having all these similarities in all these different species doesn't make sense to me. There could literally be silicon-based life forms, which are another very likely type of life that would be almost like living rocks or living crystals. They would have such long lifespans and move so slow that our life would be a blink of their eye. So how would you recognize that as an intelligent species? How would they recognize us as an intelligent species? Uh, like one thing I think is uh, some of these bigger mushroom species I think are intelligent. I think they have some kind of consciousness, but they're so alien to us in the, tr in the sense of the word that we can't recognize each other, that we have, that we're so foreign to each other. It'd be like, if I could tell you this rock was sentient, how would you communicate to it? There's no way as it right now. I know I just spit up a whole bunch of words. So I found it finally and I, it okay. was going to kill me if I didn't find it. But yeah, I was kind of close. It's, Aumau, Aum, Aumau, Aumau, yeah, Aumau, Aumau, yeah. <laughs> it's like right. from Bird is the Word. <laughs> yeah, something like that. So this is a an artist concept of Aumau, Aumua, Mua. No, it's Aumua, Mua. There you go. There, yeah. yeah. So that object was incredibly metallic, as far as we could tell by our scans. It was very long, long and cylindrical. And the most crazy thing is it literally it seemed to slow down when it got into the atmosphere or the, the atmosphere, when it got into the solar system. And then right before it left and it was just last year, it seemed to speed up. And Interstellar yeah. just flew by. So it reminds me of the Black Knight satellite, right? Where it's in That's our That's another weird one. It's in it's orbiting backwards. So what is that? Retrograde or something? I don't, I'm not yeah, the Black Knight satellite. Where it's orbiting our... We didn't have the technology to orbit it backwards, and that thing was in there, it doing it. And then you have this one. I didn't know that aspect of this one where it slowed down and kind of... It could have it could be either Jeff Bezos and his phallus of a ship, because this is another phallus-like okay. ship, right? <laughs> the Blue Origin. Yes. Or it could be this extraterrestrial life. So... <sighs> We have the idea of these entities because I, I grew up, right? I, I was I grew up Pentecostal Christian, and I was always told that too that their demons are in outer space, and that astronauts have been visited by demons. That would make sense that these occultists are able to summon these entities, and they resemble alien greys, but also like the Ashtar Galactic Command also resemble that Nordic style. What what is it like the old heavy metal with tight tight jeans or whatever it was and just like comb back with glitter on their face? They always remind mm -hmm. me of that whenever you see these these Aryan type aliens and punk rock stars. Yeah, exactly. Like that that type of style. And one of the things that stood out to me was speaking of speaking to other entities and, and peeking into other dimensions is because Crowley was using the system of Enochian magic that John D and Edward Kelly were also messing around with. And Edward Kelly, John D and Edward Kelly were also encountering entities similar to these Nordic beings, but they were actually angels or mm -hmm. demons in these other realms. They, they were demonic beings more than likely. Mm -hmm. But I always found that interesting because when I, because I've read through the actual magical journals of John D and not just the his biography. Like I've actually, he's got this entire set of his, of when they were doing his workings. And I always found it interesting. The, the descriptions that they gave of these, of these entities, some were very radical. Like he had the face of a son like his his face was like that of a son and just very righteous, like something that you would hear in a Bible. So I think that maybe this Enochian tech, and obviously you have you have Tony Merkel with that story of the Enochian military technology where I believe that the elites do tap into this tech and they use it. Because like I mentioned earlier, science, seance 
it's the same thing. It's magic. It's the same thing that they were doing back then. Just they have white lab coats today instead of robes. They have white white lab coats and they're doing their whole thing. But yeah, I just found it interesting that it was it was the same the same descriptions. And you're making me think now with what you're saying, like, what if it's not? So what do the real aliens look like? Are we even able to perceive them? Do you have any idea of what they are? They just gelatinous beings and they take a form of what we interpret, right? Interpret better. So, yeah. Yeah. I I don't know. So that's the thing is speculative. That's speculative biology. Uh, any world they would come from. So we have a very limited, uh, most humans have a very limited idea of what we expect aliens to look like. Like We almost make them always humanoid because that's what shape we're familiar with. Uh, But let's say a creature came from a gas giant. It's going to probably be huge. It's going to probably look jellyfish kind of like. It's going to be extremely tough and it may feed on electricity because uh, what's an abundance in a gas giant is the electrical storms. So if a creature can figure out how to eat that, and they may be silicon-based, you know, they may actually have a crystalline structure inside their bodies, so they're able to actually harness and use that electricity as energy. So literally, you cannot think of what an alien could look like because the amount of biological possibilities are so freaky. Like, we have species on this planet that don't look like anything. Uh, We have one that's, uh, oh, what is it called? Uh, a discarion, which is an extinct species. It looks like a big pancake with armor. How do you spell uh, it? It's, I cannot think it. I can't spell. Uh, <laughs> but no, it's like a look up ancient fossil animal pancake. It'll look All like right. a big pancake. Because it's funny you said that. And that's why there's a show on Netflix. I forgot the, the show that it does that. It shows different species on what they would look alien like alien planet or alien worlds or something like yeah, that. yeah something like that you know what i'm talking about yeah and they did a yeah they've done all kinds so but if you even watch that show you still have familiar shapes and i don't think i don't even think that show was far enough gone because you're talking about having yeah the disc what is it called was i close it was definitely not pancake monster but let's see here let's see a dick in <laughs> a dick in Sonia. <laughs> dick and Sonia. That's close. Who but names yeah, this stuff, pancake. bro? What a troll. Uh, it's a big pancake. But so like there's these creatures like this that look like kind of rocks. I mean this looks like a like a crab uh, what's it called? The crab, not a crab spider. The horseshoe crab, right? Yeah. So that, I think they may be in the same... I don't think they're in the same family group. I take that back. But there are animals that look so much unlike animals. Look at this, dude. This, uh, this is an alien. Look at this thing, bro. So you want to see a really weird one. You can look up the iron-skirted snail or the iron-clad snail. These guys live on hydrothermic vents in the bottom of the ocean, like four or 500 degree water. And they eat so much metal, they incorporate it into their skin. There you go. Whoa. So instead of having a classic armored foot, they actually push metal out and incorporate it into their flesh and create this big sheet metal armor. Like all that stuff on the flesh part of the snail is arm it's metal. That's wild. And that's the how they say nature is metal and it, absolutely it is and the way it's able to adapt to things. That's why I go why are we wasting time going into other planets if for uh, for those that are that get triggered cuz I have some flat earthers that listen to the show and they know I'm not a flat earther but I entertain the ideas right I'll, I'll respectfully agree to disagree. Now, that's why it blows my mind that they want to go to other planets to do what? When the bottom of our oceans, dude, have aliens already. Look at this thing. They're big. As you can see, some people holding them in their hands, stuff like that. Uh, they don't do good. Like I don't know. That's an African snail, I believe, right there, an African fire snail. But uh, giant armored plated snails. And each group of snail on each different hydrothermic vent has a different armor. Whoa. They figured out how, like, there's some that have, like, sulfur scales and stuff like that. Uh, there's animals that, on the bottom of the ocean that eat sulfur. But keep in mind, these are all things in our biological tree of life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So imagine, try to imagine, it's an, almost impossible to imagine an alien outside that tree of life, because our tree of life has so many wild forms. Yeah, yeah. That, that now think of something that's outside of that. An alien could literally be, like you kind of said earlier, a big puddle of jelly. 
mm-hmm. and it could be hyper intelligent. Uh, it could look more like living dirt. You know, it could look, it could be dust. It could be a big vaporous cloud. You know, we don't know. To have the idea that we're going to ab- be able to see an animal, or uh, even if it's sentient, see an animal from a different planet and recognize it as an animal, I think is not foolish, but pretty uh, not thought out because ignorant. Yeah. Yeah. We go to environments on this planet and we see stuff that we don't realize are animals. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's freaking, you just showed you a snail. There's a species of tardigrade, which there was a species of tardigrade discovered in a Walmart parking lot that eats asphalt. <laughs> I said the the little water bear looking thing. Yeah, but there's so there's like thirteen thousand different species of them. So water bears are known for being incredibly tolerant, but it depends on the species. Uh, there's a couple species that eat steel. There's a couple species that eat glass. These things are terrifying though under a microscope. They got all these teeth, bro. I think they're adorable. They look crazy. They look wild. moss piglets. So those, uh, if you believe in space or whatever. Those actually have made it to the moon and Mars on accident. I've heard about that. I've heard about that. So they rode on the outside of the shuttle, not on the inside. Look at this thing. It's got claws. Yep. And it, like, each species is very different, as you can see from these little pictures already, that uh, they can be vastly different. But so some species of tardigrade are able to freeze dry their self, and we don't know how long they can do that for. Yeah, they are pretty cute, right? <laughs> I have a stuffed one upstairs. <laughs> but look at this. It's like a Majin Boo type of thing. I was going to say like Oogie Boogie from uh, Nightmare Before Christmas. Oh, yeah. The little, the little, the dog, right? Oh, no. The the big bag of bugs. Oh, I don't know. Um, there's a lot of movies I haven't watched, but don't judge mm-hmm. me. I don't. I, I, there's a lot I haven't watched. <laughs> but no, so there's all kinds of, there's Baby Yoda, Tardigrade. Yeah, so there are things, how I said, because even if you think about the microscopic world is another hidden occulted world oh, full of, of being. And what are those things that I remember as a kid rubbing my eyes and you could see things in your eye? I mean, you still That's can't. really cool. What phenomena. is that? Those are bacteria and stuff like that. They're, you're actually like catching for a second. Uh, most of them are on the actual. That's why they look like they're not moving because it's almost like a burnt image for just a second. So it's like you're you're making your eye take a picture, <laughs> but if you remember seeing them, they're not yeah. moving. Like they're yeah. the sh- they'll glide across your eye, yeah. but the shape isn't moving. So if it was a you know if it was the animal, you'd think it'd be moving. And when you turn off the lights, you'd see them everywhere. You remember? Yeah, that? yeah, yeah. I yeah. Mean, oh yeah, I would still do it. I rub my eyes horribly. Yeah, my wife hates it because yeah. I make a noise when I rub my eyes because I'm like pushing my eyes into. And it, I know it's really bad, but I'll make like the squeaking noise, and she fucking goes wild, bro. <laughs> Oh man. So But so this is just examples of how crazy just life on this planet is. Mhm. Just here. And these are all animals that have evolved to be on this planet. Let alone somebody that came from us like imagine an animal from Mercury where it rains sulfuric acid and it's a thousand degrees every day. And imagine, you know, animal from Jupiter, big gas giants or a frozen ice world. Everything's going to be different. And it's funny you say this because, again, back to John, D, and Edward Kelly, I think that they figured out a way to peek into the, and that's what it is, scrying into the aethers, the other dimensions. And they describe beings like that, bro, huge pyramid-like beings with light at the very top of it, and just crazy, crazy descriptions. I think I might actually do a video just on the descriptions of the entities that they encountered because it's wild. And Do you remember the movie The Mist? That's Stephen King, right? Uh, or is it The Fog? I can't remember which one. I think the I know Fog, which one. Stephen King. The or Mist is people. the one yeah. where it's the, all the monsters are in it. But any, I think it's The Mist. But it was a government experiment that was trying to open windows into other worlds. Yeah, Stephen King. Yeah, with the big tentacles and everything like that. And the, yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, The Mist. So they were trying to open these windows into other worlds, the government was, and it was a door. I really think that's what happened to stuff like Point Pleasant and stuff like that. So I, I go back to Mothman a lot because we've done so much on it. But do you know with Point Pleasant at the time of the Mothman, the Mothman was not the most exciting thing happening. What were they distracting us with, from with this fuzzy little Mothman, bro? See, 
I don't know why the Mothman got remembered. So paranormal uh, poltergeist activity. There's a I can't remember what county, but the poltergeist you know research center that area. They were up like three thousand percent every year. Polter, like everybody had stuff flying off their shelves in Point Pleasant, West Virginia. People were seeing so many UFOs for those couple years that they got bored of them. There was one report, I think John Keel took the report, where the UFO sat over the lady's house like 20 foot above, like a big egg, uh, for 28 minutes. And she's just like, I, she went inside. Because he's like, how long was it there? She's like, I don't know. I went inside. Didn't do anything. People were seeing UFOs every day low to the ground. The men in black were everywhere. And we have a whole series on the men in black. Where There's three types of men in black, in our opinion. There's the not from here's. There were like the the sorry the things that look like lizards wearing a face like the red lipstick and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah. There's the government men in black, and then there's the people pretending to be the government men in black. And Point Pleasant had all three of them at the same time. Literally, uh, Mary, the big reporter with John Keel, uh, she had all three of them in her office in two hours. Wait, can you? So it was the actual government, the men in black, the so lizards. Yeah, there's the not from here's wherever they're from. They're not from here. Okay. There's the government, and then there's the guys that are acting like the government mm -hmm. so they can get information on UFO reports and stuff like that. Yeah. There's a famous guy. I can't remember his name, but he hated John Keel, and he was famous for dressing up like a man in black to get people to tell him their UFO <laughs> stories. So those are kind of our our personal, our three types. But when you're dealing with the supernatural or the not from here men in black, you know, there's almost two or three of them always. They're almost always in unison when they're out and about. But when they're, you know, in person, they seem to get really confused when you're watching them. Like the famous ones that came into Mary's office, there's three of them. Uh, they were saying, so this is a lady that's pretty much just reporting on the Mothman stuff and the Poltergeist stuff and a little bit of UFO stuff. And they threaten her. They're like, we want you to stop talking about UFOs. She's like, well, why? You know, the UFOs aren't the big, like to her, the UFOs weren't the big story. The giant flying black owl with glowing red eyes and nobody could keep pantries you know anything on their pantry was the big story and they're like we want you to stop and one of the three was fiddling with like a pen like he'd never seen a pen before like it was just it was alien to him like it was the way he was looking at it she was she was getting distracted by it and the more she looked at him the more she was realizing they don't look like people and that's kind of the famous thing she's like and that that's common with those men in black cases the longer exposure they have to an individual, kind of the more their facade starts like losing effect. Uh, when you're seeing them from far away, they look like people. The, the longer you're up close, so they're like, "We want you to stop." And she's like, "What's going to happen if I don't stop?" And uh, I believe it. So they slid a little piece of paper across the desk to her. I think it was her mother's address in Akron, and that's all it was. And as they were trying to get up and leave. They couldn't get out of the office because they didn't know how the door worked. <laughs> but nobody remembered them coming in. So they literally, one of, I think it was her secretary had to go and open the door for them so they could get out. Interesting. It's, so it's almost like these, inter, my personal belief, these interdimensional beings, I don't think they're good. Those ones, those version, I don't think they're good. Uh, but when they're not being watched, they probably walk through walls. You know, they're not quite mm -hmm. on our frequency. Mm -hmm. But when they're being watched, they're like, oh, we can't walk through this, but we don't really... We don't know how this works. Yeah, because they're not used to this human experience. They're yeah. used to floating through walls. and Yeah. So I, I want to segue into the organic UFO, but before we go there, what are, do you believe that the, because they pose as the government, do you believe the government sends them or do you think that the government maybe has let them be a little bit free and do their thing as long as they don't really interfere all too much so, with people. You know what I mean? I think, yeah, I get you. Personally, my personal beliefs from the 40s to like the mid 60s, late set or mid or early 70s, I think it was the not from here's that were just doing whatever they wanted because they couldn't be stopped. Like they didn't care about the government because they were so they were a step up. You know, they, they didn't care. Uh, and then I think they started working with them. If anybody's in control, my personal opinion, I think it's the not from here's because they're so much more advanced. So when they started working, quote unquote, together with the government, I think it's more them saying what's going to happen and you guys get a benefit from it. That's my personal opinion. Because we have CERN 
and we have that's you could kind of sort of label them the government, right? I mean, yeah, they got to be they're pretty I powerful. Think government. Yeah, and you have just weird other that you have the Area Fifty One, so we kind of sort of know that they dabble in these realms of the paranormal or the unseen, and I think that because that's that back to that conspiracy where they said he made a pact with them and. It's, you know, as long as they can study people and you have that. I was listening to to y'all's cow mutilation episode and how how weird of a phenomenon that is. And I remember in Puerto Rico, I've told the story before where I grew up with stories of the chupacabra before it was this dog canine type of thing. That's why when when I remember seeing it, reports of it here, when it started to come out as a cane and I was like, that's not a chupacabra, bro. That's that ain't it. We we, uh, uh a dog with mange or whatever it's called where it loses all no that's not it. i remember it being this this mutated government experiment that got loose in the in the puerto rican rainforest and i remember as a kid dude i was probably six years old my dad's friends talking about how they knew somebody who had a farm and their all their animals were sucked dry of the blood i remember seeing the news reports as a kid bro like i grew up with this i grew up with stories of this thing reaching in because in the island we have the shutters reaching in and trying to grab people this clawed hand was trying to go in and, and, and drag people out of their houses so there was like this panic for a very long time in puerto rico of what was killing everything and i my dad had friends that would stay up all night at the in the ranches trying to catch this thing they stay up with guns and they're trying to catch the thing, the thing that was killing their, their animals. And at my aunt's house, my uncle's house, I remember one day I showed up and they said that something had hit the, so we have like these, these concrete walls and then it just leads out to either a river or like a Creek, or whatever it is. And there was a concrete wall behind their house where they had like the garage. Cause the garages over there are, they're not like the enclosed garage. It's like, two you know three brick walls concrete walls and then you park the car in there and it's kind of open out in the open type of it just has a, a roof over it and behind there he showed us where this thing had literally punched hit the wall and you know the typical superhero movies where they where when they land they send that shock wave out and it's like a circle well it was that but on the wall he's like yeah i remember i heard something at night just like kind of swing on the wall and just hit it. And when it hit, it caused like this hole in the wall, like this, this indentation in the wall. And they didn't know what it was. If it was a monkey or if it was what it was, something hit the wall and it made this circular indentation in it. So I grew up with all these stories. And I remember taking, I was in Puerto Rico and I was in the rainforest, the national park there. And I remember taking a walk because I had hiked through it and I had parked at the top of the mountain and the hiking trail, we kind of just took it and I stayed on it for whatever stupid reason. I shouldn't have. But we took it all the way down to this bottom part of the mountain. And I was like, shit, now I got to get back up. So I had to walk the road in the rainforest all the way back up. It was either hiking all the way back down and up the mountain again or taking the main road. And I took the main road and I remember having this eerie feeling feeling that I was being like, again, being watched, but it was the same type of feeling I had out in the smoky mountains when I was fly fishing because I was al- well, with my guide, but we were alone, but there's no cell reception. There's no nothing. It's, it's, it was raining at the time when I was climbing up the mountain. And so it, it had that same feeling, but point being that, I grew up with this cryptid being one thing and it kind of sort of morphed into this other entity that was completely different. And I don't know if that's part of the psyop like, hey, guys, don't worry. It's just like a dog looking thing, like a like a thylacine looking thing, whatever it's called. It's OK. Right. They're just coyotes with mange. Don't worry about it. And then in the, in the meantime, this other little reptilian type of thing is in the background. Right. Watching everybody. Mm hmm. <laughs> When's this, out of curiosity, before I tell you this next little thing, when does this episode come out? Not next week? 
No, not next week. No, no. Perfect. So our season opener is next week. All right, so time travel. We actually did the Puerto Rican Chupacabra. So nice. This is this is what I grew yes. up with, bro. Very reptilian. The quills or the feathers on the back. Yes. Uh, El Yunque National Rainforest. That's where I was is at. Is the yeah. only national rainforest in the U.S. and in Puerto Rico, you know, part of the U.S. But it's only national. Ra- it's the only rainforest that's governed by the U.S. Forest Service. Uh, we went heavily into the Puerto Rican Chupacabra. I don't know if it was a psyop calling whatever we have in Texas and Mexico a chupacabra or not, but it definitely is not the same thing. Yeah, and then a hundred percent, it turns into this. Wow. Yeah, when I when I saw this, I was like, no, dude, there's no way. But then you see, you see the look at it, you see the, the mix, the evolution. So I was like, no, yeah. it's a it's a dog type of thing, and then it it's like kind of half bat, half not. But yeah, what I, this is what I grew up with. And yeah, was, and that's that is most of what people reported in from at least our limited research or not our limited research. We did research are pretty good. We did a bunch of stories, but it definitely was more reptilian and even bat like in some in some cases. Uh, and do you know this about Puerto Rico, for example? I, I didn't know you live there, or did you live there, or did your grandparents live there? So I was born in Puerto Rico, and I lived there till till I was like six or seven. Okay, do you know that Puerto Rico has some of the biggest cavern networks in the world? Yes. And no one's been allowed in them since 1949. I didn't know that, but... <laughs> they are the only caverns in the world that have fully or that are fully blocked. It makes but we you... did a whole... Sorry. It, 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 I'm not bad. I said I mute myself when I'm not talking, so you don't hear the, the clacking, but I have been to some of them in Puerto Rico. This is this, They call this one the window... In, in it's beautiful in Puerto Rico, yeah, and you can see out into the mountains and everything. It is very beautiful. And I didn't know I didn't know that about the caverns and them not being closed off to people. But it makes you wonder where they get concepts for movies such as what's that movie where they're underground? There's these beings that the big bat creatures. What's the movie? Ascent? Ascent? Is it? Ascension? Yes. Ascent. Ascend. Ascend. Something like that. Well, anyways, those type yeah. of movies where it's they're they're subterranean horror movies and these mm-hmm. hidden worlds. And my buddy lives in in Vietnam, and they got a lot of caves too, dude. They have one of the biggest cave systems where it's a full underground forest. It's a whole ecosystem. I'm gonna pull it up now. It's called Oh du- yeah, Dung. Dung Nong Cave or something or other. He tells me that they'll wait for that because I told him like, bro, let's go and 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 we'll we'll, we'll stay because you can camp. They do like a tour. He's like, bro, the wait's like two or three years, bro. Mm-hmm. And then Ovid hit and it was like shut down for a while. I think it still might be shut down. But you're making me think about this. I might hit some people up who live. I have a bunch of family that lives over there and be like, hey, have you ever been to the cavern? See if there's any because there's weird mermaid stories of Puerto Rico. And how people see these entities under the water. And I grew up with, again, these weird local tales. By the river, there was a lady whose baby drowned or something. And she every now and again, you'll see her standing by the river, all in white. I remember growing up with that type of shit. <laughs> and mm. so, because remember, I was, my family was, was religious. So it was like, no, there's, there's things that you're not able to see. There's demonic things. I, my grandma's talked to me about exorcisms that she's done. You know, I've I've seen miracles too, and and Pentecostal they dance around and speak in tongues. So I've seen things that maybe are supernatural, but it might have a an explanation. Who knows? But I, I have seen things in front of me, and I've seen people be healed. I've seen mm-hmm. you know I've seen people get up and start walking, et cetera, et cetera. So I do think that there is a hint of supernaturalness there. So I don't know. I'm going to pull up the cave that my, my buddy, he lives near. It's called the Hong Song Dung. And this place is mm-hmm. massive. Dude, look at that. These are tents. Oh, yeah. There's yeah. an entire forest. There's a here. rainforest in it, yeah. Here it is. They right actually here. have the Eurasian unicorn in it. What? Or the, the Asian unicorn. It's a type of, I think it's a bovid. I can't remember its actual name, but it's super, super rare. It's one of the most endangered ant- mammals on the planet. And they're actually found in the cave system. What's so it's it like called? a cow. Unicorn? Look up the uh, Asian unicorn. This? That's an OP. It's not that. 
The Asian unicorn? Yeah. There it is. This thing? Yeah. They call it a unicorn because it's so rare. What? What's so special about it? <laughs> they're they're super endangered. Like they're almost extinct. Does it really only and have as one? As far horn? as big mammals, they're super super secretive. Uh, they're super hard to research. It's weird because when you think of uh, larger mammals, you know it's easy to track them and stuff like that. These guys put some of the best guys in the the field to shame. Like they are almost impossible to track. Do you think this is where like? dragons come from because it kind of sort of if you or if you were to look at it very quickly right imagine say that running through the bush at you that's what i'm saying yeah yeah definitely i mean there's there's all kinds of wildlife i think dragons i i think some type of animal that resembled a dragon existed we had an episode on it for patreon but i think most dragons just depict the local very powerful animals like kind of mixed together mm-hmm uh, to show, like, really, you know, every dragon from every culture is slightly different, but it still depicts the things you think are powerful, the things you think are mighty. Whether they're big, they don't have to be big, but so, like, the uh, like the vipers of Asia, that's why a lot of their dragons are very snake like, because the mm. viper is something you have to respect. Because okay. if you don't, you're done. Yeah, and the nagas. And then you have the horns. Yeah. Mm. But, yeah. So, so, sorry. No, you're good. I want to segue into the organic UFO. Yes. Because that's that's one that when I heard the, you guys on the episode with Joel and Sean, Kill the Mockingbirds, shout out to those guys. When I heard that episode Hi, with Joel you, and Sean. <laughs> with Merkel and them, I watched the movie Nope for the first time. I hadn't, mm-hmm. I hadn't seen it. And I remember going to the movies to see, I forgot what movie I saw, and I saw the poster for it when it first was coming out and I had told my wife, I'm like, Oh, I want to come see this, but I never went. Cause I, I'll be honest. I always download all my movies online. Right. Cause I'm, I'm a bit of an introvert. So I remember seeing the poster and I never watched it until I heard the episode that you guys did. And I finally took the dive and I, and I downloaded it and I watched it. It blew my mind. Like it, it just blew my wig back. Cause I believe that Hollywood, I call them cinema magicians. They, they do put these things into these movies, this this predictive programming, this subliminal programming, all these things that they put in. They plant these little seeds of the possibility because I think that movies are portals to other dimensions. They carry people's consciousness. There's a reason why the during the Great Depression, movies, movie theaters survived. It was because of that, because people would go there in order to forget about everything else. So they were being mm. in, initiated pretty much at these movie theaters. And that's why they survived the great depression because people would just forget about their life. So their consciousness, if you think about a movie, it's a bunch of uh, pictures, a bunch of sigils just flashed in front of you. And Jay Widener, I did an interview and I was like, Hey dude, you know, the movie theater, it's kind of like a, uh, remember the AMC thing with the stocks and how everybody didn't want them to go out of business. So everybody pumped the stock. So they never let, even through Ovid, they never let movie theaters die. And it's because it's a simulated cave. Because we're talking about caverns and all that. It's a simulated cave. And they flash a bunch of lights at you. Jay Widener's like, hey, as a Hollywood director, I can tell you that's a very effective technique. It's a very effective technique for mind control. You know, the the original MK Ultra. Mm-hmm. So by them putting these things in these movies, they're speaking to the subconscious about the realms of maybe it's to get our reaction see how we're going to act i've heard that the tic tac video was a they were testing out to see how they would act like oh yo look at that thing to see what that pilot would say in that situation that's why they had done that to that pilot and then when they came on they were like yeah there's ufos everybody was like yeah tell us something that we don't know (laughs) yeah they're like half the country had seen them yeah nobody nobody cared because they were like okay yeah show me i want to see the little gray alien that's what i want to see i want to see hey you know what if Biden just peels back the, the mask? Like, hey, it was me the whole time. And it's like they're running the White House. Like, who knows? But when I saw that movie, it blew me away. And short a couple of weeks after that was when I was sitting outside. And I, I, I told the story when I was on with Eric. I'll tell it again because I you were the one of the first people I told when I saw it. Yes. But I had my first UFO encounter. And for some reason, bro, when I was watching it, and my wife and my son, my son actually saw it first. 
And my wife was there. And my wife doesn't believe any of this shit. She doesn't, she could care less about the occult, about aliens, big, but she don't give a shit about none of this stuff. And she's like, hey, when my son pointed it out, he's like, hey, look, it's a spaceship. Because he loves aliens and stuff like that. He's like, it's a spaceship. He's like, oh, Actin, he's four years old. And I'm like, looked up and I go, what is that? My wife goes, oh, it's a, it's a, it's a drone. But yeah. Except it's not making a noise. I mean, if it's a drone, you hear the, zzz, you know, it, she's like, oh, somebody's just flying a drone. I go, no, no, no. What the fuck is that? She goes, wait, it's not making a noise. You're right. What is it? And it was, dude, it wasn't a balloon. And it was not, it was moving pretty quickly. I didn't have time to take out my phone, but it went from one side of the sky and it was like this orange orb. And it, it I want to say it was like a jellyfish, bro. It was mm-hmm. like an or like a, orange orb was transparent because you could still have that white hue to it and you could see the the orange in it it was like the white hue and then inside of it like a smaller like a like an egg yolk inside of that but it was orange and it was the true dude it was the my wife's got a video of me just like this the rest of the night because i was i was just outside smoking a cigar just hanging out right just relaxing and i just it was the craziest thing dude like i never experienced anything like that and that was the first time I could ever say I seen something in the sky because I'm always out, not as of recently, but I'd go out fishing right here in these in the lakes here in, in, in the swamp, pretty much in these shallow lakes of Florida. And every now and again, I mean, you see wildlife. I never saw really anything crazy. I did see one other UFO in Homestead, which is near a, a military base, again, in the Everglades. But I chalked it up to it being a bird or something because i didn't really actually see it like for an extended amount of time it was only a split second right in homestead there's coral castle you have the story mm-hmm. of edward lead scallon so you have that that whole story of him uh, ufos helped him build it or whatever it was but then this one i was there and i saw it for more than i want to say it was probably at least 30 seconds bro it was at least 30 seconds and it felt or something told me it felt organic it wasn't like a sp- like a ship, right? It was organic to me. And then it kind of, it kind of clicked, but I don't know if it was the movie influencing me, right? Cause I had just seen the movie or if it was actually like this orb. I don't know how to explain it, dude, but I promise you. And I wasn't the, the, the beautiful part is that I wasn't alone. And I, and I recorded my son's, I don't know if I sent you my son's reaction, but you know, it was a four year old kid reacting to what we oh, had you seen. did. Yeah. I did. And that's, you could see like, the wonderment on his face. That's what I'll say. Like, but the feeling for when you started telling me is very, very important. So I'm working on a project. I can't release it yet, but it's directly dealing with organic UFOs and stuff like that. So real quick, I got to give my disclaimer. I think organic UFOs are 5% or less of UFO sightings. Cause everybody I've gotten in a lot of trouble with the UFO community because they think I say, I mean, every every <laughs> UFO you ever see is an organic UFO. No, I think it's literally less than 5%. I think, you know, there's a lot of other stuff you're seeing. And a lot of it's paranormal, a lot of it's not, you know. But specifically when we talk about these guys. Uh, but that feeling you got, it's really cool. I've had now, I'm trying to think. We've done interviews on the show that aren't even out yet the, with organic UFOs and stuff like that. But the jellyfish type and the manta ray type, which I can go into more detail here in a minute almost always have that kind of feeling about them. Specifically, the jellyfish type uh, have this feeling of that they're alive, that they're, they're, they're elastic, they're moving, they're, they're interacting with the air around them. And the manta ray types are really cool because almost everybody that sees them, that I've talked... Sorry, it cut out. I've talked to people that have seen them in Australia and Europe and stuff like that, these manta ray shapes. And they don't mean like they look like a manta ray, they are just kind of shaped like a stingray or a manta ray. Uh, but they're still gelatinous. But they describe the sense of awe, not being scared of them, being like, uh, I've seen humpback whales and stuff like that, and that's how most people describe them, is like being in the presence of a whale. You know, something that's so different than me, but not, not nobody's scared of them, Th- at least those two types. Uh, they don't ever seem to do anything. But that is amazing. And the, the yellow or the orange light inside the belly, or I'm going to call the belly, is pretty cool. Uh, So the manta ray and the jellyfish, the jellyfish type has a bunch of little lights. Some of the reports report a bunch of little lights around it with kind of a big center light. 
and the manta ray type has like a big light in the middle and I kind of imagine like headlights. Uh, so if it's flying at you, it almost looks like it has eyes, which I don't think it does. I think it really is. It may be related to jellyfish. Well, um, it, which... it, do you know Ryan Burns at all? Shout out to Ryan Burns. Mm-mm. So you should probably have him on your show because he's been chased by. He calls them. Anyways, he has property at Skinwalker Ranch and golly, he calls them something. I forgot what he calls them, but he's been chased by these orbs. Yeah. And and he explains them how you're saying, like, if you look at it from the front, it looks like headlights. But then when when they get to you, they almost like scan you or or take something from you. It's very, very weird. I mean, obviously, Skinwalker Ranch is a weird area, but. Yeah, I'm trying to get the picture, uh, the video of me looking up because my wife took a, a video of me. I was just like looking so, up. With the the ground orbs are a little different, in my opinion. And not there are some organic ones. Uh, we can talk about the ghost, uh, the ghost of the Sahara, which is a famous orb kind of thing. So we call them sky snakes. So the ghost mm. of Sahara is an ancient legend. It's this uh, big glowing orb that kind of bounces around the desert. There was a white guy, and let's say like the uh, Chaz of the Dead tells this story. I don't know if you ever heard of him, but yeah, I've had him on the show. That... Shout out to okay, yeah. So he, it's his story. Full credit to him. That's who I got it from. Then I researched it after I heard it from him. But that's what you talk orb. about on the, the mutilation episode. Yes. Yep. I give. I try to give credit when credit. You know, when I when I borrow things. But he had a story where this ghost of the Sahara was this big orb that would fly around, and all these natives were saying, "Yeah," to this white guy. It's always a white guy. They say, don't go over there because if it sees you, it'll start hunting and it'll kill all of our cattle and stuff like that. But if we don't mess with it, it don't mess with us. He's like, oh, okay, sure, sure. So sure enough, night falls and he sees this giant white or blue orb kind of gently going through the desert. And, you know, of course he's like, I got to go see what that is. When he gets near it, it transforms or it lights up and reveals the whole body. It's a giant, almost translucent snake with glow with glowing lights on it. And then it killed a whole bunch of sheep and livestock that night. It came back, it followed the guy back to the village and it started hunting. So the sky snakes are these, most of the time they're either black or they're translucent. But these are probably your, uh, I'll go into like the environment up in the upper atmosphere and stuff like that. These are more like your sharks. Uh, they're the active predators. They're the ones that are moving fast. These are the ones that are hunting. So for that example, I think it was using the light kind of looking around the desert for food. When it sees somebody, it follows them back because humans, we have a lot of livestock, a lot of easy food. It's in a nice pen. It's easy to catch. You don't got to chase nothing, and you can eat uh, if you're eating meat. What's the name of the story? It's Ka- Kalahara or something like that? It's either the Ghost of the Sahara or the Ghost of Kalahari. I can't remember which one. I'm sorry, Sean. Okay. Or it's Chaz a- of the Dead. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, Chaz-, I'm all- Chaz of the Dead, yeah. So, huh. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything pulled up for it, but it's almost I like I can send a, you this stuff. Like a, it makes me think of a. I play Dungeons and Dragons, so I should know this. The. The banshee, the screaming banshee type of thing, where it's like this entity that, that floats around like a ghost, right? Like this yeah. ethereal being. So. I'm gonna talk about the atmospheric layers real quick, if that's okay with you. Yeah. So, yeah, I have this whole little... That's the only thing i got to read because I can remember the rest. But So I believe most of these creatures are living... So we live in the troposphere. That goes about 10 miles up. That's uh, the human eye, and I, I think I was on the Strange Roads podcast and somebody commented about this. But the human eye can almost... Yeah, there you go. Perfect. Uh, this is the one I'm using for everybody at home. But yeah, you can see it. It's the same one as you got pulled up, but with the numbers beside it. Uh Uh, the human eye can only see fully unabated by like 10 miles. People are always like, why do you see stars and stuff like that? Because they're self-illuminating. They're actually pushing light towards you. Uh, but the human eye can only see detail for like 10 miles. So the, the troposphere stops at about 10 miles. And then the stratosphere starts. And the stratosphere is from like 11 to 31 miles. But right at the bottom of the stratosphere, where it meets the troposphere, is the ozone layer. Everybody always talks about the ozone layer. So the stratosphere has an inverted temperature which means it gets, or it has a vertical temperature, so it gets warmer the higher you get. Once you cross from the stratosphere up, it gets really cold. 
and then it starts getting warmer as you go up higher. Then it meets the mesosphere, which does the exact opposite, has an inverted temperature. So it starts warm and then gets cold again. The atmosphere actually has like these hard, almost, it's hard to imagine, but almost hard layers in between it. They used to kind of separate out. Uh, so I think most of these creatures are living in between the stratosphere and the mesosphere. So that area is like 40, 45 degrees. It's full of water. It's, you know, it's warm. And people, the radiation levels there, everybody's like, oh, how can life survive? Because the radiation levels, they're very survival for many forms of life on this planet. But I'm going to tell you now, so any questions about that? That's pretty much that. I just, I think most of these creatures are living in that in-between layer of the stratosphere and the mesosphere. And we're just getting them every once in a while down here. And... I know this is going to trigger some listeners right now, right? But hey, just stick with us. Whatever you believe, just put it off for a little bit. But the idea that we, because we talked about the oceans earlier and these crazy snails and all this stuff, that the craziness, the manta rays and that look like aliens, like those are aliens, bro. You can't tell me otherwise. Well, as above, so below, right? As the hermetic principle goes, the law of correspondence. And they talk about the waters above and all these things. Well, it wouldn't be out of the realm of possibility if there was things existing, how they exist at the bottom of our oceans exist in these other layers of not existence, but of the, the we're sharing the same world. You know, some things live here, other things live up here, but the things up here obviously are going to look a lot different than the stuff down here. Same how at the bottom of our oceans, it looks different. How we're talking about how, different levels of gravity or where things are going to evolve differently. So absolutely. Yeah. Continue, please. I think that's perfect. I, we, I often compare the upper atmosphere to the ocean because it has uh, the open ocean environment it has the same characteristics. It has pressure extremes. It has temperature variance. So the open ocean, like a lot of these creatures, how they deal with the open ocean is they either get really fast, which we see in these organic UFOs because you got to escape predators because there's nowhere to hide. You get really good at camouflage which like the, these, some of these creatures we think that disguise yourself as clouds and stuff like that. What's the most abundant thing to hide, like to look like is a cloud or you get transparent or translucent. Uh, basically you don't have to move fast if you're invisible or you get really big. Those are kind of the options. And we have groups of these that kind of mimic all those. There's open ocean counterparts for every category that we can go through. But yeah, so there's no hard structures up there. So that's a lot of these, that's why they mimic the open ocean so much. Um, NASA did a study. So this is kind of the fun one, everybody. And I know we all have opinions on NASA. I personally, I go with, uh, what is, what's Jay always go with? He goes, not a space agency, and I always go, never a straight answer. But so it just depends on what you pick. But NASA did a study, and it was 2013, 15, and 19, I believe, were the years they did this study. So they built this thing that's similar to a hestridendi. And that's a big, that's a $5 word. It's a basically a bug and bacteria hotel. I used to build them for work you know, for rivers and streams. How do you spell so it? No idea. <laughs> I can't spell. I have so many. I have a couple learning disabilities, believe it or not. Say it again. I can't uh, I'm not going to make it Hester funny. Dendi. It's named after the guy that made it, and he had a horrible name. It's like an ecosystem, like a contained ecosystem? Uh, it's, a, it's a bug and bacteria hotel. So each, it starts very, very small, the, the gaps. And gets very, very large, so it's like a big... It looks almost like a pine cone, kind of. Uh, but anyways, we'd put these in environments, and they have food in them, and they're, they're perfect environments to grow these creatures. Uh, what we would do with that, then, is we could tell what species were present in the system. We'd come collect them in a couple weeks. So we built these similar ones for giant balloons. So everything I'm about to tell you... Everything I'm about to tell you... Yeah, that's a hestridendi. So okay. that's a hestridendi cinder block. Yeah. They're bug hotels. That's what I used to do. I, that's one of the things I used to do. Uh, it's, not, it's not every day you meet somebody who's built a Hester Dandy before. I mean, that's pretty prestigious, No, it's like, bro. I think there's like 15 people in the U.S. that probably even know what the hell that <laughs> is. Oh, but man. that's what a Hester Dandy is. So you kind of get the idea. Those little gaps are perfect for bugs and bacteria to grow in so we can ID species later mm. in an environment. Okay. They're, we call them bug hotels is the, the quick word. Uh those ones are built for aquatic habitats, though. So these ones are built... They built these special ones for upper atmospheric conditions. So in the mm. 2019 study, they basically built these big ones, put them up on weather balloons right below the ozone layer, 
and left them out for like a couple of days to see what they get. They were only expecting a maximum of 14 species of anything. And that counts algae, that counts, you know, this is still above or below the ozone layer. They accidentally found over 4,000 species. Every clade of non-vertebrate life has a representative up there. Whoa. So there's a jellyfish cousin up there. There's a worm, you know, all these creatures have representatives up there. So they don't even, they've never done that. They've never done the study again. And they didn't do it very well the first time because they think some of the animals were eating the other animals on the way back down. <laughs> so there's probably more. There's probably six, seven, or 8,000 species they found in this first survey, uh, the 19 survey. Uh, so there's jellyfish in the upper, we found a jellyfish cousin in the upper atmosphere already. We start talking about these types of organic UFOs here in a minute. That kind of makes more sense. They were up there. Uh, it just is crazy to me. So we have documented thousands of species up there. It's just, it just it blows my mind. And it makes it gives this kind of theory we've been working on more credence, because where you have tons of microbes, these like these small animals and stuff like that. Think of the open ocean again, when you have these big colonies of little tiny animals who follows the bigger ones so the smaller yeah. fish are at the bottom yeah. the medium ones and then the sharks are at the so top so if we have this giant base of an ecosystem where's the rest of the ecosystem well it doesn't fit in the box you know we mm. only expect to catch the bugs in these astrodendies but is so, that law though dude if there's a smaller one there's always going to be a, a medium one and then there's always going to be a bigger one is that is that always in, right in nature? You know what I'm saying? In most environments, yes. It's it. We I don't I can't think of any example. Now it depends on who the big one is. You know, the big one in some of these systems may be you know a foot long, but there's still yeah. a big one. You know, it's relative. You know, there's going to be the big guy in the group. Yeah, like uh, Joe Biden. But life has life has shoved its way into every other gap on this planet. Why would we think that this area, the biggest environment? the biggest environment on the planet has the least amount of life. I think it's the exact opposite. And these in this area above the ozone and stuff is the least likely to have giant impacts to change. You know, a big meteor hits the earth, everybody's affected. But when droughts start affecting below the ozone, it doesn't really matter above the ozone. There's kind of that hard line. There's always the same amount of water. So why are these creatures coming down? Well, we have kind of found from our research that the manta ray and the jellyfish type, I think they're filter feeders, which is more like an amoeba, not like a whale. They do like they look like a whale, but they're kind of running into the food and like absorbing it through a membrane. But we found through our research that the manta rays are almost always seen, the big ones are almost always seen around mountain ranges. So there's two big reasons for this. Is you know what you ever heard the word detritus? Detritus, no. It's a fancy word for organic dust. So think of all the stuff that's blowing around in the air uh -huh. that's actually food for a lot of animals. It's called detritus. It gets shoveled or it gets pulled into a giant, like a, imagine like a, uh, oh, I'm trying to think, like a slide to the upper atmosphere on these mountain ranges. So it's being carried on the wind. It hits this mountain range and goes straight up into the atmosphere. So it's a big feeding colony. So there's all kinds of detritus. A lot of it's aquatic. It just is, it just means little particles. Anything floating yeah. in the water, Dead or the air, particle, organic material. Yeah, it's just little stuff that's organic. That's big detritus. So when we dealt with it with work, most detritus looks like just muddy water. Mm, okay, I got you. I got you. Yeah, yeah. When when the the river but, gets stirred up or something. Yeah, that's organic material that's in the water column, mm. but it works with the air too. So these are feeding grounds. If you had a giant filter feeder, there'd be a reason for them to come below that ozone layer and sit over these mountain ranges and feed. Uh, there's a lot of them in Florida, too. The manta rays get seen a lot in Florida and Louisiana. And I think it's because it's the end of the, or not the, at the end of the, the Smokies and stuff like that. They're hanging out. But so that's, the, so the manta rays, I said the word a hundred times already, they are seen to be gelatinous in nature with a couple lights, a big center light and a couple lights around the edge. Almost have a blue or white. No. Uh, they've been seen up to 150 feet long. 200 feet long, and, you know, about twice as wide. So they almost have the giant wings like a manta ray and the general manta ray shape. So it's almost more like a tube with the manta ray wings. They don't have the headgear of a manta ray. 
but they've been seen doing these giant filter feeding eights. And I shouldn't say filter feeding. That's uh, they do these giant eights, these figure eight kind of motions. So this is a very famous thing that open ocean filter feeders do to catch more food. So what this does is when you're twisting in the air and you're doing this eight, when you come back around, you're pushing all the food in one spot. So you get more food on the yeah, second like, pass like when you do this motion. Like whales, manta rays, all these big filter feeders. So there's a, there's a thing in nature called covergent evolution where animals that have a similar niche develop or develop a similar body plan. So if this thing is be acting like a big filter feeder in the upper atmosphere in a similar environment, it could develop a similar body plan. That's why it's looking like these manta ray shaped creatures. You know, it's the same thing. It's just, it's doing the same job a manta ray does. So it makes sense that you kind of look like a manta ray. But I do think they're probably related to jellyfish because there are jellyfish up there. And then I can always, that's kind of the manta ray. I can move on or any questions about the manta ray? You said in Florida, there. so how many, and I got the video of me looking up uh, at the sky, but how many sightings of these things have, have there been? Well, so personally, I, like I said, I'm, I wish I was further along because I'm working on a, a project with this, but I've collected around 500 in, encounters with these things. Like uh, uh, asking people about it? That I've had a bunch sent in to me. I've interviewed a bunch of people. And then historic ones I found it, you know, going back through other people's shows and contacting people and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So I have around 500 that I've already got saved and I'm still working on more. Oh. Uh, so I at least have, of the manta ray shape, so I got them broke down to categories. The manta ray shape, I at least have eight in Florida and probably five in Louisiana. Yeah, I've never, I had never heard about that until I came across y'all's work i had never and is there any interviews with what's his name peel they got that, that peel. Real, yeah is it jordan and peel or something like that what, whatever the guy's name was that oh, created the, i don't think so and that's a weird thing with the nope he had a marine biologist so uh the creature in nope's nickname is jean jacket so the ending jean scene uh, spoiler alert everybody at home the ending scene where it starts flashing the colors and stuff like that mm -hmm. to fight the big boy or whatever it was in the sky. Uh, that's exactly what a cuttlefish does is the threat and uh, territory display. That's a hundred percent. My bad. Yeah. This is just me yeah. looking up at the sky still after. We had seen. <laughs> and I'm just like, just waiting for another one to cruise by. Yeah. And I was just like texting people about it. So we were just hanging out. I'm, I'm looking around <laughs> like a, like a fucking psycho, bro, because I wanted to see another one, bro. It was crazy. I, I do that stuff. I like sit, like sit on the back porch all summer and look up and wait for one to pass. Uh, no, there's a lot of these sightings, but the, the thing from Nope, and he also had government consultation. So if you look in the credits, you can find that. We talked about it when we were on Joel's show and stuff like that. But really? do you remember what other movie had that? What other UFO movie had that? Signs? Yeah, or was it Signs? Or what's the one... Uh, that was a good guess, big, though, right? The, yeah. Uh, <laughs> with the witch's tower. I, now, now I forgot. With the witch's Don't tower. Don't drink at home, kids. Like uh, Encounter of the Fourth Kind or whatever. Oh, kind. well, I mean, that, that movie's hardcore, though. I mean, that that's like yeah. full on. That had, that had the same thing. Government consultation in the credits. Dude. Really? I mean, who reads yeah. the credits, right? Uh, I do, because I'm a psychopath. Well, I'm saying who, like any regular person... I'm, Obviously, we're a different breed, but a regular person isn't going to... I mean, we're two grown-ass men talking about UFOs right now. <laughs> Gel gelatinous <laughs> UFOs. So I don't think a lot of people are reading the credits, but hit, hidden in plain sight, right? They put it out there and like, meh. But I, I wonder if they've interviewed him for this movie and like what he's had to say. I'm going to look it up to see if he's said anything about it because it's such a unique concept. And again, dude, I had never looked at it this way until i came across joe had talked to me about you guys and like oh yeah dude organic ufos i was like what the fuck are you talking about bro he's like yeah dude they're animals what yeah they are <laughs> so with the the next kind of type is like what i think you maybe have saw sorry crappy internet it's either 
you saw, in my personal opinion, if uh, you feel it was organic, it's probably either the manta ray or the snake's type, the jellyfish, which has less of a defined shape than the manta ray. These manta rays seem to always kind of have that general shape, the big flapping wings. Uh, the jellyfish kind of look like balloons sometimes. They sometimes have tendrils. They can have a big core light. And they normally have, like, people describe them as LEDs. Nobody's ever seen a video of a cone jellyfish. Uh, you should pull a, a video of that up for them. Because a cone jellyfish with a bioluminescence looks like a machine. So I'm not going to play it, but there is... There is an, an interview with him? Yeah, it discusses ideation of the new horror film nope so this was five months ago and he does well, you got a government check is why probably and his, but he did i'm gonna watch it later i'm gonna i'll have to watch it too so this movie gave me the most unsettling and most anxiety filled experience i'd ever what i had ever had watching a movie but you know c continue with this because i've got my own theories and all this so uh what was i saying i'm bad with this about the there's the the ones that I saw the was yeah jellyfish. Uh, so the jellyfish can be up to the biggest one I've ever had a report of is 600 feet long and about 200 feet wide. Uh, and they're most of these creatures I believe are mostly gas filled and they're using their fins or whatever to steer. They're not actually like flapping to fly. They're probably producing their like fish have swim bladders. Uh, you know that by everybody at home. Fish have swim bladders and they actually produce gas for buoyancy. I think it's a very similar system that these guys are producing a gas for buoyancy internally and using these small fins to kind of steer uh, rather than you know powered flight when you think of a bird or you think of a bat. They're forcibly having to move air to get flight. These guys are more like balloons in that nature where, and they're steering with these big fins. Uh, but the jellyfish can be 600 foot long. Most of the time they do have tendrils, but they kind of look like a blimp with lights sometimes. Uh, if you look up a cone jelly, that's what I was saying, that's what I was saying. Uh, cone jelly with bioluminescence. They literally have what looks like LED lights running down the sides of them. There was a one famous video that got around on Facebook. It's like, look at this deep sea UFO at the black, like uh, almost hourglass shape and everything like that. It's a cone jelly. They're just a very unique species or group of species. They have like, yeah, they don't look real. But yeah, they just have amazing bioluminescence. Uh, there you go. Everybody at home will enjoy this. Now, imagine you've seen that in the sky. Uh, yeah. That's Definitely. a UFO. 100%. It looks like a uh, and Christmas then tree. Yeah. Uh, but there's some that have blue and red flashing lights. Like, they don't look... Like, if you couldn't see that, like, the body, which is almost translucent right there, mm -hmm. you just see lights. So how can you tell if it's one or 20 or, you know, 200 of them? It just... It could... And there's a, another species called... Uh, it's either fire I think it's firefly squids they're about six inches long Christopher Columbus had a famous story where when he were across the Atlantic they thought that they kind of described it being on a disco floor of lights and they didn't really understand what they were seeing like they were literally in the ocean looking down and these lights were sequenced so the whole mass area around their vessel had sequencing lights underneath and it's these little tiny butter or firefly squids that have these two glowing appendages on their feeding tentacles and they kind of raise them up. But they do these massive breeding events. They'll be two or three miles wide and they'll all synchronize their lights. You ever look into this, bro? I haven't. What's it say? The 51 Celestial Phenomenon. 1561 no. Celestial Phenomenon over in Nuremberg. And it's these dis depictions of these things over the... They were, they're having like this battle for for days, bro. I this have to look into that, but that may be a breeding event. So it, it, I don't know. I I'm really into the organics because so, I think a lot of the, some are some of these. This is amazing. A mass sighting of celestial phenomena or unidentified flying objects occurred in 1561 above Nuremberg. Uh, this view is most mostly dismissed by skeptics. Some referencing Carl Jung's mid 20th century writings about the subject, while others find oh also well, Carl Jung even wrote about this. That's interesting because he was. Wow into some other next world stuff, like ne next level stuff as mm -hmm. far as the subconscious. But here it goes. The woodcut illustration depicts objects of various shapes, including crosses, small spheres, two large crescents, a black spear, cylindrical object. And apparently there's more of these too. There's there's more. There's other ones as well. There's other events here over basil. So you have this thing as well, which is a, a series of mass sightings. 
a, a basal pamphlet of 1566 describes unusual sunrises and sunsets. Celestial phenomena were said to have fought together in a form of New Year's. So there's there's a few of these, bro. If you look around, I'm gonna have to look into them. But I I could definitely see something like that bringing these massive. So I believe these most of these guys are bioluminescent or have bioluminescent qualities. So imagine if you've seen some of these creatures that are six, seven, eight hundred foot long, thousands of them breeding above your head with flashing lights and giant colors and giant bodies that it's hard to recognize. Mm-hmm. I mean, that'd be the end of the world. Yeah, so these like, looking up at that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and I think that most of the time they're so high above us that we really don't see them. Uh, but yeah, so that's the, like the jellyfish type. Like, like uh, it's funny. A lot of Europeans have the jellyfish type. I think it's, oh gosh, Sweden has one of the really big famous ones that was seen by three or 400 people. This giant, slow, jellyfish-like creature going over the mountains, and a whole village seen it. And uh, there's another one with the... Man, that's amazing. So it kind of looks like the sky snakes. Yeah, you got these, these big, long scrolls. tubes with eyes. And think about it. This was during a time when religion was finding its footing, right? The 1500s, late mid to late 1500s. So you had the whole battle with religion which one was coming out on top so to these people this was this was the apocalypse this was i'm sure it was this is the end of the world dude so think about that like oh god is pissed off at us and he's sending some stuff but i mean who would right and look at this was this like a mothership and they were all there and there was just like a cosmic battle and then you got the sun what's all that about i mean is it happening during the daytime because there was accounts where, look, and this, this is on fire. So were they like shooting down? Some are crashing down or something. So, and this would go on for days, uh, allegedly, from from what I've read. And this is the actually world is a, German, I think. A mysterious, strange place. There are so many things that happen outside of most people's realities. Mm-hmm. That even I, I personally, I look at nature, and there's animals that people don't believe exist that I know exist. Mm-hmm. That not even getting into the paranormal. So what's out there that's, you know, a little extra or the extra normal or the extra, you know, biological or the extra this, whatever, you know, there's all kinds of wonderful, amazing things that happen on this planet that are above explanation. There are some things we're never going to explain. And that's, I think, well, I love that because there's no end to the chase. Yeah, most definitely. I think that it's what, Einstein called the spooky action at a distance. There's things that we're not going to ever figure out because I don't think they're meant to be interpreted by our minds. They exist. In, outside, yeah. yeah. So the idea of having these animals, these, I'm not going to call them entities. I'm going to call them, you know, organic beings that exist in a different environment than us. I mean, it's not too far fetched, bro. No, but, but the mean, fact that I had never heard about it before now you're telling me you have over 500 accounts that you've personally gotten from other people. When do you, when you're, because I know you guys do a lot of cryptids and people write to you and all this. When do you, where, where do you draw the line though, dude? Do you think that people are actually seeing these things or do you think some people are, because there's got to be people who are full of shit, right? There's got to be the ones that are just pulling your chain or whatever it is. Personally, yeah, I think so. I mean, I, we've had, We've had interviews we've never published because it sounds just bad. Tell. It sounds like bad. Like, uh, yeah, you know, like it just there There are always people that either I will never tell anybody personally. I will never, ever tell anybody that they didn't see or they didn't have their experience or they didn't have their encounter. It's just not me. It's not my fight. I don't care. You don't come out here and say you've seen whatever you wanted to see. What am I going to do? Like, I don't care. Uh, but when we get like sometimes we've we've had a couple get into the interview and then it's like okay, come on, like even with the stuff we talk about that we believe in, and it's like they had everything that happened with a bigfoot like there was like you have every single thing that's ever been reported to have in a bigfoot like first there was knocks and then we found a stick structure then it threw rocks and then we smelled it and then it was like okay you have all this stuff is this raining blood. I don't know. It's in Dutch or German. I'm just going through. I'm going to send you this link because these are all the different plates of these accounts. It was during this time. So that's one of the with the living clouds. 
we literally have a report from the U.S. here in 1883, I believe it was, of this giant cloud in Illinois coming over this little tiny town. And everybody's seen it because no, it was black. It was a big black cloud. And these, all these people were looking up at this cloud, pastor included. Sorry, cut out. Yeah. It just started pouring blood. What the heck? And then the cloud left. And what happened in the movie Nope? Oh yeah, the 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 UFO dissolves people and it throws everything else out. The blood it included. squeezes them, so yeah. it's an esophag it, it's esophagus. It actually and this is just from us looking into it so much. It crushes it because the water is the liquid inside our bodies is extra weight that's not nutritious. So if you're a flying animal, you want to get rid of all the excess weight you don't need. Yeah, like birds and having hollow hollow mm -hmm. skeletons. A lot of birds will even throw up when in flight. If they're having too much trouble, they actually have a really good mechanism to get every, all their extra weight out. Whoa. So we have all these raining blood events that I think could be uh, some of these clouds that may have engorged themselves. Another famous one is Louisiana. The raining bones, millions of bones fell in this town over this big black cloud that threw them up out of the front of the cloud. And they were almost all gar bones and scales. But literally, like a week before, they had a flood that receded. There was thousands and thousands and thousands of dead gar in the local dam. And I think this thing was scavenging, ate a whole bunch of gar, digested what it could, threw up the rest like an owl. You know, owls will actually do that. They'll produce this big pellet of stuff that they can't <laughs> digest. So all this stuff happens in nature already. It's just putting it onto an environment that has very little study. Um, but something I talked with Joel about on his show. So there's all we can go into this. We, there's so much stuff with this we can go into. But one thing I do think is going to happen, I've made this prediction, in the next five to ten years, they're going to come out and they're going to have a body of one of these creatures. I don't know what type, but they're going to have one and say, like, see, look, UFOs are these things. They're just organic animals. They're harmless. You know, they're big filter fears. They're like whales in the sky. And I think it'll be the best cover-up for other types of UFOs. Because then, all of a sudden, if UFOs are just an animal, nobody cares about them anymore. Literally, we have species going extinct every day because nobody cares about them. So once people realize there's just animals up there, nobody cares. So every time you see a UFO, it's not a big deal. You've seen an animal. It's like it's going to be. I think it'll be the best thing that the U.S. government can do to start if they're testing this stuff or they know these things are coming here. They're like, now we don't got to worry about anybody looking into them. So I I bet you the next five to ten years you'll see one of these big gelatinous bodies on a flat bag truck <laughs> produced by the government on, yeah. for that goal. Uh, we have stories of them. There was one story from Chile where a bunch of miners these things are not mortal monsters. A bunch of miners seen these big manta ray kind of cruising about forty feet above their camp, and in Chile they just looked up. They all grabbed their guns and started shooting it till it crashed. A big, and it was. They said it was kind of like. I, I have the newspaper article, but it was like jelly, like it kind of like jellyfish, but it's harder, more, more. Uh, firm. There's more stuff to it. Yeah. Yeah, per, more firm. Thank you. And they cut a chunk off and kept it. Uh, but the funny thing is, we hate the Smithsonian. Well, I don't hate the Smithsonian. I hate the people that run the Smithsonian. Oh fuck the Smithsonian. Big difference. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah. That the, the actual. I I think the museum is one thing, and the people that run it's a whole other thing. Like the, the building you go to is fine. Fuck both of them, bro. <laughs> <laughs> we did a whole, we did like four hours on the Smithsonian NASDAQ or NASPRA. Anyways, <laughs> the funny thing is the Chilean farmers, the South American Smithsonian uh, base camp was only like 30 miles away. So they were like, oh, we'll just call them. And they come down and got it. Never so to they, be heard from or no, seen. No, nothing, again. nothing that goes to Smithsonian ever gets seen again. But the farmers, they had the chunk of the, one of the fins, and they took it into town, and there's all those reports of people like, like, look at this thing. Like, and then it rotted, you know, it's jelly. It rotted very, very quickly. But yeah, so you can shoot these things and kill them pretty easily. But then there's like the star, valley, the star rain events, or the star jelly raining events, and the Kentucky meat shower and stuff like that. I think it's when these larger animals die in the higher atmosphere. Their bodies are really soft. So when they start coming through the atmosphere, they kind of shred into these big piles of jelly or these big piles of meat. Uh, the one in Washington, the star jelly event, made everybody sick to touch the stuff. Like, deathly killed four or five people. 
And so looking back at jellyfish, cool thing about jellyfish, kind of cool for them, not cool for us, is they can sting way after they're dead. So their, their stinging cells are kind of like this, where they have this little trigger on them. It, so it's not a nerve fire response like us. It's just a trigger response. So if something touches that trigger, this long tube shoots out, hooks into the animal. So it just it, this long trigger, you hit this little switch, shoots up into the flesh, it grabs on, and just keeps pumping venom. They can do that long after they're dead. That's why you see a dead jellyfish on the beach. Never touch it. Don't go near it because you can't see the tentacles. Yeah, it still can sting you very bad. Uh, my brother got stung really bad from a dead one. It just so now these things have similar. If they are jellyfish, are cousins of jellyfish, and they have similar firing mechanisms. And you have this giant chunks of their flesh everywhere. Literally, there was a there was I think four to six people died in that one. I'm now I'm having trouble remembering. But literally, one little girl picked it up. I was like, huh. Mom, look, and then she fell over, and then she died later that night in the hospital. And it would make sense, too, of why certain areas are radioactive and they don't know why. Well, maybe one of these things died there, and it's just it's there. You can't see so, it or whatever, you know? My last type is kind of – well, not my last type, but one of my favorite types is these silver disc. I kind of – I believe they're a living fungus – or not living fungus, that they're uh, atmospheric fungus. There's a bunch of species of fungus that feed off of radiation. So their bodies would be very radioactive. So that could be, you know, they fall and die there. You know there's going to be residual radiation. Like, me and Tony, Tony picked on me for this. So, Tony, if you ever listen to this, I'm going with it again. <laughs> I think the Tic Tac UFO was actually a living silver disc. And if you watch the behaviors of that, of the, my personal opinion, just uh, it looks like a dolphin playing with a tugboat. Mm -hmm. You have this big slow, which is the fighter jet, but it's mm -hmm. so much slower. It's on this side, then it's on this side, and I'm in front of you, now I'm behind you. Okay, I'm bored, I'm leaving. And take just gone like that. So Skinwalker Ranch has these silver discs that look like they're falling straight out of the sky. You ever seen that video? No. It looks like it's falling straight out of the sky, and then right at the last minute it curls up <laughs> and just starts gently taking off. It looks like a dolphin. It looks like there's an intelligent animal that's mm -hmm. kind of just playing. And I really think that these are fungi, and there's plenty of species of fungi up there we found. Uh, I always talk about Bob... Bob's the largest living organism on the planet. He's the largest living organism ever, as far as we know. Uh, he's smarter than all of us. Do you know what Bob is? No. Bob is a mushroom out in Washington. Uh, he is 2,200 acres if you were to square him up. Uh, he has an entire state forest on his back. How they discovered Bob is they drilled a borehole. He's a honeycomb mushroom. Uh, but they drilled a borehole into this forest... And a quarter of the forest died overnight. Wait, dude, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Bob the mushroom. I googled it. Doesn't come up. What is going on? So, type in just a world's largest organism mushroom. He'll come up. It's a state forest out in Washington, Oregon. I always get them mixed up. Okay, let's see here. Strange but true. So, is there like a picture of it? Because I've heard before. That. No, he's almost he's almost all underground, so he's the he's the forest floor. What the? F oh, hold on, I gotta hit the button for this, bro. I got a button. So for yeah, there's Bob. He covers about three what and a half square fuck? miles or twenty two hundred acres. <laughs> so cool thing about Bob is that we now we know we used to think it was more of a symbiotic relationship between him and trees and some some insects, but now we know he fully integrates. Oregon, there we go. He fully integrates into the forest on his back. He uses the forest to feed him. And through fo or through uh, soil evidence, we found out Bob will selectively kill chunks of forest on his back. Dude. To allow grassland to grow to re-nutrify the soil. And he does this kind of big clock pattern on his back. Uh, he can think faster than any computer we've ever built. So cool. we're now starting to put fungi into computer chips and stuff like that. So they have this really cool ability. They don't have a nerve system like me and you, but their version can transport data from one side to the other much faster than us and much faster than computers. They're very awesome. Uh, yeah, Bob's amazing. So see how th that's how they integrate into the whole forest. So Bob is 2,200 acres if you were to like kind of square him up because he's imagine like a big octopus is what Bob looks like. But that's only if Bob only goes down 
about eight feet. That's most of their species only goes down about eight feet. If Bob's so big, let's say there's a cavern down there. Bob could be gigantic. So Bob is the biggest organism. We think he's he has two sisters uh, that are not quite as big as him, but still large. Uh, we think Bob's like, it depends on who you're talking to, what estimate they give the age. But most people kind of put him around 44 to 45,000 years old. I love how they put the sequoia from, Hyper- have you ever heard Hyperion? Yeah. Yeah, well, I think they put this here as a homage to the the, the Tesla trees in that book. That that's, Oh, there you go. That push out the electricity every so often. Mm-hmm. So it's comparing the the sizes. But, man, this is blowing my mind because I'd never heard about this. And the idea that that when you take mushrooms, it feels like you're tapping into, like, this hive mind. Well, what so, if you're tapping into because when I took mushrooms, I took it at the peak of of that thing that happened in 2020, bro. And I could feel the anxiety. I could feel the the desperation of everybody that was mm-hmm. at home without a job. People were dying. We thought it was the end of the world. I could feel that, bro. I could tap into that through mushrooms that I grew myself. So... Here's the crazy thing about mushrooms. I believe they are some level of sentient ship. When we're talking about aliens way like two hours ago, this is kind of the thing I go with, is that they are so alien to us, even though they're from here, at least as far as we know, that they are so alien. I think they are some level of sentient ship. So I think they can receive our data, like all the all the information we're putting out in the airwaves, all that stuff. I think they get it. I just don't think they really know what to do with it because they're so alien to them too. But when you get when you take mushrooms and stuff like that, people report talking to these entities that seem to be really excited to talk to you too. Like there, even some of them say like, "We're glad you figured out how to talk to us." And I kind of think that you're tapping into like you were saying the hive mind of these guys that they're not. It's not an individual kind of thing. Like Bob shows that they get monstrous. Bob is one mushroom. And he's the size of a, he's that whole valley. The whole valley you're looking into is Bob. Can you imagine that being that big and being able to transfer data across you faster than any computer? It's just, it amazes me. But I do think they're some level of sentience. So when you take mushrooms, I do think you're tapping in or getting to that kind of level where you're having some kind of communication with them. Is he spreading? Is he still spreading? Yeah, he's still growing. He's young. He's not showing any signs of old age. What? So you said that so, he kills off entire sections of the forest whenever he he deems necessary. Kinda. So he think about a mushroom. A mushroom benefits heavily from a healthy environment. So Bob integrates into the trees. Literally, the trees cannot survive without Bob. So I was saying when they first drilled into Bob and cut a section of his arm, like one of his arms off, the whole section of forest died because he they take their mycelia and they get into the trees and run them. They hijack them. Uh, so what Bob does is he'll kill a whole section of forest when it starts getting to be old growth and stuff like that, and he'll let grassland grow. And what that does is that re-neutrifies the soil. It brings back good soil. So when later on he starts growing trees back there again, they grow back healthy and strong and stuff. So you don't get these big dead zones later on. But yeah, he, he's amazing. Like it's There's a level of intelligence there that we're not thinking of. And here's the thing with Bob is everything on his back benefits it's one of the healthiest state forests we have he takes care of everything and like they're showing you he's in the dead trees he's in the living trees he's in the grass uh there's even some evidence that he's hijacking some uh insects and using them he's actually Dude. getting into these insects what this is i this is blowing Bob's my, one mind of my favorite right things on the planet but i think he thinks so have you ever seen this is kind of bad but I don't know. It matters how you feel about <laughs> mushrooms. Have you ever seen when people take a synthesizer and plug them into mushrooms? No. So you should pull up a video of that. Like synthesizer the instrument? Mushrooms. Yeah. Well, they make a special one for mushrooms. So you can make one for humans that reacts on our nerve pulses and it makes music. So mushrooms don't have a central nerve system. They don't have nerve pulses. They have a similar thing, though. Uh, mushrooms are closer to animals than they are plants. So you could, they made these synthesizers just kind of see if mushrooms are thinking, and they don't shut up. They're constantly buzzing. 
And kind of the bad thing is, if you eat mushrooms or whatever, when they plug the synthesizer in, they definitely react to being cut into. Uh, there's one in the video, it almost seems like they're screaming. But I don't think eating the... So when you, you know, the mushroom that comes above the ground, that's just the sexual body. That's not the, that's not the real body of the mushroom. Yeah, yeah, the mycelium that's, that's is under, sex, underground. Yeah. yeah, that's when they come together, yep. when two spores come together and make that, the mass of that. Yeah, so the mycelium will produce that. It's like almost their fruit. So, yeah. All right, so I let's believe, check out five minutes of oyster. pink oyster mushroom playing modular synthesizer. So let's see what this sounds like. What? There's no way that sounds like that, bro. Oh, it does. Are you serious? So what that is, I promise. So what that is, is what we would call in a mammal or an animal, a nerve pulse. Or a, so that's you thinking. That's your body reacting. That's us doing things. They don't have a central nervous system. They have something kind of similar. That's them thinking. That's them doing stuff inside. That's It's amazing to me that we don't think these things. Like That's the thing what I'm saying. When humans go out, if we do ever meet an, an alien alien, we're not even going to know because we can't even look at this thing and think it has any kind of intelligence because it's so foreign to us. It's so much not like what we're looking for that we don't care about it. But that's thought. You're hearing thought, in my opinion. Dude, this is so trippy. <laughs> I love mushrooms. So mushrooms, animals actually split from mushrooms. If you believe in the whole theory, like the whole family tree and the theory of evolution, everything. Not the other way around. Mushrooms, fungi were first. The oldest complex fossil we have is a mycelia network. And that's like 810 million years old. They they sound different. Too. This one sounds different. Oh yeah, but when they start cutting into them, they make different sounds and stuff like that too. Uh, oh, when he, they give them water into... and stuff, they'll make sounds. Really? Oh, so he starts to interact with them, does he? He just, dude, yeah. that is so crazy, bro. So here's the thing with these beings: when you take mushrooms and stuff like that. I think some of them are mushrooms you're talking to, actually. That's what, uh, yeah, because because when I was on on not to interrupt you, but when I wait, no, it's it, okay. It felt like that. It felt like something was communicating with something was telling me like, yo, you know, work can't like. <laughs> and now you're freaking me out because I think what we really truly have to worry about is the mushroom. Bob keeps growing and growing and growing. And he's going to take over the world. And one of the things that the, and I always said, the, what the mushrooms told me was, we're a cancer to this world. We're a can to this earth. We're a cancer. We're destroying ecosystems. We're, we're doing all these things. And I was, and I, I don't want to say I was forced to watch, but the only thing that I could bear to watch when I was doing this was this, our, our, our world on Netflix. And now that I think of it, I think like the, the mushroom was like hijacking my mind and be like, no, you're going to sit here. You're going to watch what we're doing, what this pollution is doing to the ecosystem. Because then that show, it shows like the cute, cuddly stuff. And then it shows the predator eating a fucking baby seal's head right at one point. And then it shows like the damages of over poaching or global warming, et cetera, et cetera. So it's like, hey. You guys are a cancer to this world. I'm going to sit you in front of this documentary because that's the only thing that you could bear to watch. Because when I, I put on The Office, bro, couldn't fucking stand it. Like, Dwight looked demonic. I put on, like, this other movie. I put on a movie of of a documentary of, like, outer space. I couldn't handle it. The only thing I can handle was the nature documentaries. That's the only thing I could stand. And I don't know if you, when you're on your computer, that you go on Netflix and everything plays by itself. Mm -hmm. When I was on that page, bro, it was all screaming at me, bro. It was the craziest thing. It was just like, ah, like everything was screaming. And then I, I'd like freak out trying to find like the, the, the thing I was trying to watch and I'd click on it and then, oh, I'd be off that page because everything was just going off at once. I tried watching Joe Rogan. Wasn't happening. One of the guys morphed into like Baphomet. Uh, Joe Rogan had like black eyes. It was like, a super i had a bad trip by the way like a super bad trip but one of the things i got out of it was 
Like just love people, love your family more. Don't be a piece of shit. Like that, like that. At the end of the day, and like take care of this, this re- reality or this planet or this whatever. I don't know. I don't know what it was, but I remember like how you're saying. I was in, con- I was in contact with something, bro. I don't. It sounds fucked up, but a hundred percent. I was either no, tapping I, into a hive mind or something was something was talking back to me. <laughs> so I also think there are bad things that you can kind of contact in those states too. But I do think some of them are these mushrooms. But they get keep in mind they're very they they have the same experience with us. They we are very alien to them. They have a lot of in my personal opinion they have a lot of trouble understanding us because uh, we're we move we're fast we're loud. So the data dump we're giving them. I think they can pick up on all the information we're putting on the internet, all the information we're putting in the airwaves. So that's speaking of my internet being bad, uh, that screaming you're describing, like Netflix was screaming, like all the windows are screaming at you. I think that's how they hear us. And they have so much trouble understanding the data they're getting from us because it's so much information. So they have more of a hive mind, in my opinion. So it's more of a concentrated collective thought when we are all individuals, so all the data they're getting from us is just like megaphones on top of megaphones. So when they actually get that kind of one-on-one, a lot of these people describe a very, like, they're very excited. Like, it's kind of weird. They're like, oh, you know, we're glad, like, that's when I always follow, I have four or five accounts where they're like, we're glad you figured out how to talk to us. We're glad that you, you know, found out, you know, they're excited because they don't know how to do it either. You know, they, they can't, I don't think they can contact us necessarily on their own. They're more internal. You know, they don't have a lot of effect on the outside world around them uh, besides what they can directly touch above them. Like, Bob can't affect Africa. You know, we could. Not yet. Without, huh? Not yet. He'll get there. <laughs> uh, until the continent goes under the ocean, then he'll yeah. be a little trouble. They don't do good with salt water. Uh, but, yeah, so I think that – I do think there's – but I also think that bad entities can take advantage of that mm. state too. To where, my personal opinion, if it's not, and that's not saying that wasn't positive, because that's teaching you a lesson, you know, that may be positive, but when it's just negative, it's probably not a mushroom talking to you. If yeah. It's just straight negative, mm-hmm. you know, because they're not, from what I believe, and I, I believe everybody, like, I have a bunch of friends that, I've always wanted to do it, but I just never have, but I do believe that that's the best way to communicate with them that they'd want to communicate with you. Literally, I'm kind of the crazy person in our town because I'll stop. We get the big, uh, we get rotting head mushrooms and we get big uh, oh, white angel mushrooms and stuff like that in our town. I'll stop and talk to them. I, I will. And Jay does it too now. But literally, people look at us like we're freaking insane. You whisper in its ears like, hey, little mushroom, what are you doing, bro? I got in trouble this year for not <laughs> mowing them. I'd mow around them, yeah. all the ones that pop up in the front yard, and the city didn't like that. Wow. So Cause it's, I think that, I mean, cause you're talking about them, them figuring out. And I've always heard that we're like, we're a failed plant experiment that we, we are here to spread them. And you have, I can't believe Paul Stamets hasn't even ever talked about this Bob guy. Like, I've never even heard him. He's the mushroom guy. So yeah. he's talked about him before. Oh, I've, I've never seen him. I mean, like on Joe Rogan, that'd be super interesting to bring up on Joe Rogan because this is a, like a crazy concept. And it was because of him, really, that I got into the whole mushroom thing through Joe Rogan. Is one of the first podcasts I started listening to was Joe Rogan, and then obviously you branch out from there. But the idea of like lion's mane and using all these mushrooms to I mm-hmm. eat mushrooms, you know, shiitake is delicious and portobello. They're all crazy, but the idea that the only way, <laughs> the only way to communicate with them was like, yeah, let's eat one, and then you're able to tap into that dimension or whatever it is. But the idea that they're probably freaking out, too, because you ate one of their own. They're like, damn, yeah, you came to visit us, but you you just ate Charlie. Like You just you just consumed Charlie. So I'm sure they're pissed off about that, too. But you've never seen there is no other species of anything else that is so versatile because a mushroom yeah. can either kill you or it can make you turn into bigfoot if you take enough mushrooms like there's like no in between it's like this one tastes delicious this one will kill you in like two seconds right like there's like there's this wide range and you guys like the ecosystem like there's animals for different things and i feel like mushrooms Mm -hmm. are just they're alien i mean they said they came from a meteorite or whatever it was they can their spores can survive in space 
I do think that's an interesting thing, and I think that may be have some some factual stuff that mushrooms may be actual aliens mm. in that sense. Because we kind of put them that animals, and that's the whole tree of life thing. And I don't personally believe in the, the whole theory of evolution. I do believe species adapt and change over time, but that's not the whole theory of evolution. The theory of evolution deals heavily with the start. And I think the start is wrong. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I think animals change and adapt. Anything that changes and adapts over time. That's how you get new species, but it's whole, the whole start. I do think fungi could be from somewhere else because they are so alien. Uh, they're so ancient. And they're so crazy. Like you're saying, there, we have species that eat toxic uh, waste. We have species that eat carpet. Like literally, there's a species that just likes eating carpet. And the one that Black in mold. Chernobyl that's eating the radiation up, dude. They love it. They love radioactive waste. Uh, and so when going back to the organic UFOs, those ones that I think are fungi, I think that that's why they're so fascinated with our nuclear power plants and so fascinated with our nuclear warheads. It's because they're like, I can feel there's food here. I can sense there's radioactive. I just can't find it. But that's just my how my crazy brain works. I try to make everything organic. But with yeah. mushrooms, they are, they're so crazy. So that mycelia network fossil, I believe it's 810 million years old. It's a, the oldest complex fossil is what it's called. Uh, it had a fully formed mycelia network. Yeah, there you go. Hold on. Like they're I, crazy. I got the wrong tab pulled up. Let me, let me check here. Hold up. Yeah, I'm pulling up. I think it was something up, bad. Yeah, I'm pulling up the... Here we go. I'm pulling up the Chernobyl fungus discovered inside Chernobyl disaster nuclear reactor. And it loves actually, radiation. Wow. It's not all you can eat buffet if you know how to do it. So, but it, oh man, what if this is, bro, what if they're distracting us from this, the killer mushrooms from outer space? <laughs> See, I think if mushrooms would have wanted us dead, we'd all be dead. What if they just don't know how to, bro? See, or what if I they're waiting? They're, all, they're ecosystem engineers. Uh, and we are such a bear burden on the ecosystem. I think they had whacked this already. But no, I, I think personally, and this is, this is, really weird for most people. I do think they're what some level of sentient ship, that kind of hive mind thing. I think they can think. I think they have some kind of feeling. You know, not I, they're alien to us. So putting a human emotion on them is wrong, in my opinion. They're not us. But they do have thoughts, in a way. Uh, but I think they don't want to take anything out of their environment. I think it's all mushrooms in, you know, that's why you always see them in folklore and stuff. It's always the mushroom with the fae folk and stuff. Mm -hmm. They embody the environment. They literally, now we're finding out more and more. So uh, here's another fun statistic. 93% of plants on this planet could not survive without fungus at one part of their life stage or another. Most seeds need some type of fungus to germinate. So if mushrooms disappeared tomorrow, just left, they're all gone, 93% of plants would go with them. Not to mention all the animals, all the invertebrates, all the decomposers. So the cool thing about wood, when plants first evolved the wood, it took around forty to 50,000 years for anything to figure out how to digest wood. There was literally these big layers of wood, <laughs> dead wood, because it was a, such a new thing, and it was fungus. If it wasn't for fungus, nothing would be digesting wood today. It's just insane. And there's but it had to evolve to that level, or the, just... Because has it those layers of wood, was it that there was no fungus or fungi at that point in time or because one of them had no, a fungi had were the like the first guys. So there were fungus there, it just took them that long to adapt to a new food source. Mm. Uh basically the the, the a hard wadded wood developed first and they're like, Okay, and it took time to figure out how to make use of these minerals that are locked into this mm -hmm. wood. So people don't realize that bacteria and fungus are your decomposers. If you had an environment without bacteria and fungus, you would break down a little bit, but not like you wouldn't de decompose. Once your stomach acid and your blood stopped eating its way out of your body, it wouldn't, you wouldn't, you'd just be there. Like decomposure is a living thing. Decomposure is a part of the life cycle. It is fungi. It is these bacteria. It is a part of life. It's, it's, it, people don't realize that, that decomposure is a living process that if you like when you die in space that's why you just like the uh, movies and stuff that's why you don't decompose you could be there for a hundred million years 
because there's nothing eating you. That we know of. Not yet. Space whales. I believe in them. Yeah, I had a buddy of mine who had a... We had a weird synchronicity with space whales because, getting back to John D. and Edward Kelly, when they were revealed God, bro, it wasn't you know this old man in the sky that is sitting on some throne, white hair, long beard type of thing. No. It was a whale, dude. A whale covered in eyes. Hmm. That's how God was revealed to them. Again questionable who who they were actually in touch with <laughs> so but it's interesting. i love whales i love whales true whales so baleen whales uh i'm sorry i can talk about animals forever if you can't tell <laughs> but baleen whales are more human than humans are uh i used to do a school lecture where i'd go to schools and talk about whales and stuff like that but so the japanese whale hunting uh practices are horrid and they've cut back a little bit, but they're still really, really bad. Uh, but one of the things the Japanese like to target, hey, whales, humpback whales in those pictures. That's a humpback you got on right now. Right below, it's a gray. I love whales, baleen whales. But so what the Japanese will do, and this is kind of a, a cool thing for whales, bad thing for them with dealing with whale hunting. Uh, they'll target a juvenile calf of a humpback normally. And what, why you target the calf is because you immediately get the mom after because she's not going to leave her baby, right? Mm. And then what happens is there's kind of a – besides – so orcas are not whales. They're dolphins, believe it or not. Uh, they're just big dolphins. But when you shoot – so when this mom, will, they'll shoot the calf, and they won't go for a kill shot normally. And the reason they don't go for a kill shot on the calf is they don't, it's crying. It's screaming for help and stuff like that. Baleen whales have been documented to help other species of baleen whales. So not even in their own species. So like a humpback whale will come to aid to a bowhead and stuff like that when they're crying out in pain. So these Japanese fishing oh, fleets have figured that out. When you, yeah. It, but it's a different species. It's a whole different animal. But it's these whales sense that problem, and they come and try to help. So that's why they aim for these calves is because they get, immediately get the mom, and then they wait for others to come help. It's horrid. There's a really cool thing. As I think it was two or 1999. So humpback whales specifically have around four to 5,000 characters in their language that we've identified. They have names for themselves, and they have names for their pod. Uh, so they're, they have names. They talk to each other. They, they communicate. But a cool thing they do is normally the matriarch of the pod, uh, normally male baleen whales are kind of off by themselves because they get so much bigger, and the females and the calves all kind of stay together. But these uh, females, these matriarchs of these big pods, they will normally do this handshake motion, it'll look like. Or they'll come and almost look like they're dancing. They'll kind of touch flippers. And it's kind of like what we do a handshake for. It's a, it's a hello, it's a greeting. So there was, a, I think it was 1999, this diver went, uh, so the, what these whales do, they'll go vertical, they'll extend the flipper, and just gently touch each other. <laughs> We're talking about an animal that's 90, you know, 90 foot long, uh, you know, 80 tons. But so this diver, 99.9, he was a whale researcher. He was with swimming with a bull humpback whale. So this nobody had ever seen a bull humpback whale doing this behavior, first off. It's only been observed in females. So this guy's swimming with this bull humpback whale, and he just got his goofing off for the camera. But he goes vertical, and he sticks his hand out. This giant animal looks at this guy, recognizes the intent, goes vertical, and gently touches him with the flipper. So not only is this animal recognizing him as another intelligent being... No way, it's, dude. It's recognizing its own language. Yep, there he is. It's recognizing us simulating its own language back to it. So another cool case, there was a... Uh, divers in Florida. So right out by you guys. Uh, do you know where Ponce's Inlet is? Yeah. So Ponce's Inlet, uh, Daytona area, has this the closest that inner or that jet stream gets to the to the uh, the coastline basically. So it's a fun spot for humpback whales to kind of pull off and relax in the warm water for a little bit. So this mom and a calf came, and these guys were free diving with this whale. 
with these whales. And, uh, sorry, I get distracted easily. I'm looking at all the pictures of whales. Yeah. Uh, I love whales. But so this mom, and, this mom calf, these guys are swimming. And they're swimming with these whales and stuff, and they're having a great time, and the whales are reacting very positively. All of a sudden, they don't know what's happening. This giant female whale pushes this free diver on her nose and throws her almost on the boat. And then she tries to get back in, and she does it again. And she tries to get back in, and she does it again. And then finally they leave. They don't know what happened for weeks. They go back to the GoPro. They are being stalked by a 15-foot tiger shark. Whoa. Never knew it. The whale knew it. Yeah, it was, was trying to like, okay, you it. need to get out of the water. You need yeah. to get out of the water. So, But think about that. At no point in that whale's life cycle ever was a tiger shark a threat. They come out twice as big as a tiger shark. So it's a it's identifying a threat that mm-hmm. it's never had for itself for a different species and then taking actions to save that other species. That is such a level of intelligence we do not give them credit for. That's crazy, dude. I never they're heard more about hum- that. I say they're more human than us because they care. They literally will go out of their way to save a different species. Uh, and orcas are the exact opposite. Orcas are human because they're nasty brutes. And their brains aren't that big, right? Because if, you, if you look at a dolphin brain, it's got like these double... You know they sleep with one, one eye open? I'm so sure, yeah, it's, so they don't drown. I'm well, sure they, you do. <laughs> they, yeah, they, they shut down partial part of their nerve system yeah. so they can repair why they're awake so they don't drown. There's only a couple species of marine uh, cetaceans or whales and dolphins that actually sleep. One of them is sperm whales because sperm whales are so nasty, nothing normally messes with them uh, so they can sleep. Well, whales eat. They've swallowed humans before, right? Yeah, they're mostly always spinning back up. That guy just got like that lobster diver from Maine. Can you imagine that, ago. dude? You're just chilling. Yeah, he got hurt pretty bad, but they're most of the time their esophagus is re- like relatively small, and they'll spit up whatever they're not supposed to be in there. They mostly eat very, very baleen whales eat very small animals. So the biggest things on the planet are eating very small prey. So when they get a diver or a shark, I've seen them spit up sharks. Like where they'll eat the whole school of fish. Mm-hmm. There'll be a shark or two in there. They'll go. <laughs> And ke- you know, kick out the sharks because it's like they can't swallow it. It's not meant to be in them. But imagine how scary that must be, bro. Oh, it'd be terrifying. I'd be praying a lot. What kind of whale like swallowed Jonah? Jonah? Yeah, I'd be like, I'll I'll talk to Nineveh. Just let me out of this thing. <laughs> what I'll kind buy of, a plane ticket. What kind of whale swallowed him? What kind of whale would be able to swallow a human if any of the big baleens you could fit in their mouth and they theoretically could hold air? Uh. Most likely, I mean, a blue whale can fit an elephant on its tongue, so you got plenty of room. Whoa. Look it up. Yeah, you can see it. Like, I think it's, if, there's some graphics of it, like a blue whale elephant tongue. Just type that in. Yeah, this is all really Sorry, I didn't know you did all these picture things. I would have brought a whole bunch of pictures. Yeah, no, I like to give the YouTube crowd a, you know, just references so they don't have to look yeah. at, our, at our ugly mugs the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just not used to it because I hide my face. Yeah, it's all good, dude. Yeah, this is crazy. See here. Yeah, just the sheer size of these animals, dude. The, 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 how... Monstrous. I love them. So the biggest blue whale on record is just shy of a half million pounds and around 112 feet long. Uh, but there's historic records that there's used to be species, or them, they got bigger, and species that got bigger. Uh, blue whales are going extinct due to overfishing, and now they're breeding themselves to extinction. So blue whales are really cool. They can communicate up to a thousand miles away from other individuals. That's a blue whale's heart right there. Whoa. Uh, four hundred and forty so pounds, bro. Yeah, with nothing in it. That's bananas. So they can communicate with other species with other members of their species from almost a thousand miles away. But the problem with that is so they're breeding themselves to an extinction. They're breeding with minkies and fin whales. So they're hybridizing out of existence. Uh they can't find mates. There's so few of them left from overfishing. We've been their only predator for such a long time. Mm-hmm. Like they evolved to be so big, so nothing could eat them. Yeah. So they don't have. They breed so slow. So when an animal doesn't have a lot of predation, doesn't lose a lot of offspring normally, they don't produce very much because they fit you. their environment. Yeah. So when a new predator comes in, they can be wiped out pretty easy. There was just a video of, oh, I can't remember where that is. Uh, you may have to post that one later because it's always hard to find. 
but a video of orcas that are kind of starving and that's a big problem orcas are kind of having a lot of problems right now too they're killing a lot of whales because they're starving but orcas are assholes all right yes yes they are <laughs> orcas are not friendly yeah dolphins are not friendly in general they're rapey dude they rape everybody yeah so 36 people a year die from dolphins on average and only four people die from sharks but yet people are terrified of sharks and swim towards dolphins I'm like, I'd rather have the shark bite me than me be raped into the sand and then drown. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's just my choice, you know, my yeah. opinion. If you had to so, pick a way know, to go out, right? I know that how the sh- like the shark is very, you know how it's going to be. The dolphin is like, I may play with you for a bit. I may be friendly this time. Anyways, so these, do- these orcas, so orcas are really cool because they partition. So orca families will almost always feed on one main food source with each other. So you can have several families living in the same area that aren't normally competing because they're partitioning food. Like you have the salmon hunters, you have the seal hunters, you know, you have, so they'll partition. So they're not going after each other's prey. Problem is, is prey is disappearing in the oceans. The oceans are getting hit hard due to mostly human activity. Uh, whether you believe in global warming or not, it don't matter. It's human activity is hurting the ocean. We can see that microplastics, overfishing, it's just other issues. So these orcas are now having to compete when they used to not have to compete. So there's whale hunting orcas. What they normally do, minkies and fin whales. So you've seen the blue whale, the big, long beast. Minkies and fins are their smaller cousins. And smaller is relative. When you're 120 foot long, smaller is very relative. You know, minkies and fins get 60 to 80 feet, 90 feet sometimes. What they would do, though, is they set kind of whale, minkies, fins, and blues are set up for long distance swimming. That whole body plans is set up to go this big, vast distance and not stop. So what these orcas will do before they start hunting is they'll set up a relay race because the whole point is to keep the whale running until it's out of breath and you can drown it. That's the only way they can kill these big whales. So they'll go along the coastline and set up a relay. So one orca will chase, 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 chase until it trades off with another orca. Chase, 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 chase off. You know. So now this big fin whale is exhausted. And now these orcas will kind of lay on top of it and not let it back to the surface, and they'll drown it. You drown Uh, the whale. So with an adult blue whale, they tried it. So there's a famous one. I think it happened 17. Uh, You probably won't find the video. I'll try to send it to you because it's really hard to find. But they these you see this big pot of orcas sizing up this like 105 foot, you know, 430,000 pound adult blue whale bull. And they're sizing them up, and they're sizing them up, and they're sizing them up, and they're like, okay. Wait, they kind of think that they, they can take this thing out. They're also starving. The only reason they'd ever mess with this animal is if they're starving. They're Guys, in mind, a big orca, a big orca is 40 foot long and 15,000 pounds. This animal is 105 foot long and 400,000 pounds. So there's a big difference right there, right off the rip. So these whales, the first whale kind of comes up, and how they get this chase normally going is they bite it on the fluke, that big tail fin. And they bite really hard. Orcas have a hell of a bite. And they'll bite really hard, and it scares the whale. It gets it running. So this one male orc comes around, swims behind this big blue whale. And the blue whale ain't really doing nothing. He's just kind of looking around like, okay, what, you know, what's the game here? He swims, bites him right on the freaking tail fluke. Blue whale doesn't panic. Rears back. Knocks him like 30 feet out of the water, kills him instantly. All the orcas scatter because it's like it's so much larger than their. But the point is, is that they're struggling. The orcas are struggling so bad that now that you know they're tired, they're taking game that can easily kill them. Mm-hmm. I'd be like, you'd run up and stab an elephant, hoping to get it running. Yeah, it's gonna squash. You know, it may work. Yeah, but if he turns around and grabs you, you're done. Uh, but orcas mostly target. Like, there's not a lot to eat on a whale, like a, a baleen whale. Uh, there's not a lot. Like, most of the time, they're only eating the tongues and the livers. So they'll kill these giant animals and only be able to eat because blubber is really bad to eat for most species. It's really hard to eat, really hard to digest. It normally takes more energy bro- to break down. Uh, great white sharks are really, adult great white sharks are really good at digesting blubber. That's why they target seals and stuff like that. Uh, like, a great white shark most of the time won't eat a person, they actually have an organ in their gums that tells them all the fat content, salt content, stuff like that of their food before they eat it. What? And they'll they'll make a calculation whether it's worth to swallow or not. 
because it may take more energy to digest than they'll get out of it. So that's a negative net gain. And when you're talking about these animals, it, especially in the ocean, it's all weighing out, you know, cost versus reward, calories burnt versus calories gained. That's why most time sharks don't mess with people. We don't taste good. Mm-hmm. We don't have the right fat content. We don't have the right, you know, we're not food most of the time. Like uh, New Smyrna Beach, you know where that is, but everybody at home, Shark Bite Capital of the World, that's where I go shark fishing every other year uh, because it's a pupping ground of a bunch of sharks. So you have a bunch of baby sharks that bite your hand because they think it's a fish. And they immediately let go. Like 99% of the shark bites in New Smyrna, which is the shark bite capital of the world, their mouths are that wide, you know, a couple inches, and they ba- barely leave a paper cut because it's where all these shark species go to give birth. And sharks lay both eggs and give live birth. It depends on what family group. You've blown my fucking mind, Justin. That's all how the, my brain works. It's all over the place. That's where my hair is like this. With 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 all the animal talk we had, we we've had a biology lesson, dude. It's almost been three hours, bro. And it had. I'm sorry. Even, it's all good, bro. I've I've had so much fun talking to you about all these things. One more thing, because you're talking about whales and how big they are and all this stuff. What's with what messes with a sperm whale? Because there's been videos where you see the sperm whale like scarred up. Does it fight other whales or is there like that's a the sperm whale picking fights? Oh yeah, with, so, with other whales. Yeah, sperm whales are sperm whales are toothed whales. They're the last large member of their family order. There used to be a species called Leviacus, which competed with Megalodon eating other whales. Uh, which Leviacus had some of the biggest teeth ever. Sperm whales have, like, so a sperm whale's tooth, for example, everybody at home, as I cut out, but a sperm whale's tooth is about that size of my hand right there. Uh, so their scarring uh, on their head is how, mostly from... How big is it? Oop, oh. Like that shape and like that big, big conical tooth is what it's called. Uh, so they're eating a lot. They're eating other whales. They're eating sharks. They're eating giant squid. They're eating colossal squid. So that scarring you see on most of it is them grabbing a squid and them just ripping at their face because the squid still has arms with teeth on it. And so the squid's fighting for its life, but it normally never wins. So it's all squid marks on that one. Uh, yeah, sperm whales go and pick their fights. Nothing alive today is messing with a sperm whale. They won that battle. Look at those teeth, bro. Yeah. Wow, and so he's so, just oh, a cool. beast. So look at their head. Go do you know that picture with the elephant. With the elephant. All right. All right, so you see that big bulbous head? Their skulls actually look like a crocodile. So that whole thing is full of what's called spermaceti. There you go, perfect. So that big void is full of spermaceti, which is their hydrophone amplifier. So most whales talk from their voice box down here. Those guys actually produce a giant uh, image, like a giant sound wave out of their head. It's so strong, it can cause organ damage to a human if they're in front of it. It, Wow, like a microwave. Yeah, it'll literally liquefy your organs and mess with them. So Dude. that's how they hunt in the ocean. They'll hit these creatures with sound waves. Uh, but here's how smart sperm whales are. The few encounters people have with them, they're very cautious about not using that around people. Because they know it's a danger to yeah. them probably. It'll, it'll kill you. They know it'll kill you. So see that picture right there with that whale coming out of the water with the other whale eating it? This one? Yeah, that's Leviacus. That's sperm whale's big brother that went extinct. Yeah. Fuck that. Imagine seeing that thing. <laughs> so that, like, Megalodon and sperm whale, or Megalodon and Leviacus went extinct at the same time because they were they were co-competing for that apex predator niche. That's why blue whales got so big. It's because there was things like that in the ocean. And they wanted to stop being eaten. Mm-hmm. Wow, dude. So I'm sure you've seen, to, to bring it all full circle, I'm sure you've seen the reports of that whale that got into the middle of the jungle the amazon you seen that yeah we actually did uh we talked about it on an episode how uh, crazy is that like a portal opened up somewhere i mean obviously it probably washed up and it was a flood or something so but. there was actually a tsunami uh that the week before and we used it as an example to show that even whales succumb to weather yeah that uh-huh. they can't like that mother nature always wins no matter how big you are uh but yeah it was a bull sper- or a bull humpback i believe it was and he was only like four or five miles inside the Amazon. He wasn't like, he wasn't like in the headwaters of the Amazon or something like that. It was pretty close to the coast. That'd be pretty wild too, right? Yeah, but, if it was in the headwaters, that'd be a little different. <laughs> well, did you have any 
closing ideas, any concluding thoughts to leave the people with? We've talked now, about... Thank you for letting me come here and ramble. Nah, dude, this is great. I mean, we're all over the place, but we talked about a whole bunch of different things. We talked about cryptids. <laughs> we talked about other dimensions, Mothman, the, the microscopic world, men in black, chupacabra, organic UFOs, all of it, bro. I loved it. I loved it. This is great. You want to plug your stuff for the people where they can, yep. they can find you? Yep. Well, thank you again. Juan for having us yeah, or having me having us as you know as a collective even though Jay wasn't here uh, but no so podcast you can find it anywhere cryptids of the corn uh, and then we also have DW conspiracy shack which is a show we produce our buddies do it but we produce it and then we also have uh, freaky fauna Fridays and I'm terrible with spelling but it's freaky and it's F-A-U-N-A I think fauna Friday and that's like a little short of that. Like we give, we do 15, 20 minutes every Friday about some random animal fact or whatever. Uh, it's fun. It's you never know what we're going to talk about. Um, if you like our stuff and you like, we have, do Patreon. Uh, we have a live show coming up. And that is April twenty second. Uh, this is what Jay's really good at. He remembers all this stuff. April twenty second. Uh, that's in Middletown, Ohio, at the Post Town Elementary. It's a haunted location. We'll do that with Hillbilly Horror Stories. So our whole thing is actually going to be about the organic UFOs. We have some videos we're going to talk about and stuff like that. And they do amazing haunted stuff. Uh, we're speaking at Encounter Quest. And the cool thing with that is you guys can go online and vote for what our topic is we're going to speak about. Mm. It's a big live online pool. I think Arkansas Giant Killer Centipede's winning right now. But I don't know. I never know. <laughs> did, did an angel just come into your room? No, no. It's just my screen. Uh, but I think... So once yeah, I think that's pretty much all of our stuff. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, all the socials. If you've seen an organic UFO, please get a hold of us. I'd love to talk to you. Uh, you don't have to come on the show, but I'd just love to talk about it. That's pretty much it. Send me your links, bro. I don't have your links. And thank you for coming on. And my birthday's on April 23rd, so you guys are going to be doing that the day before my Ooh. birthday. So that's pretty cool. But Awesome. Yeah, dude, this is great. I had a lot of fun. We should do it again soon. And maybe you'll have Jalen with you, and he'll... We will chop it up. This is really fun. It'll be a com- Thank you. This, this flew by almost three hours. So I no. didn't realize it was three hours either. <laughs> You're good, bro. Well, everybody, hope you enjoyed that. And like always, make sure to follow the show on social media at the one one podcast, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, all that stuff. Rockfin.com slash the one one podcast, patreon.com slash the one one podcast. And thank you all so much for being here. See you on the other side.